testosterone covenant. It's a contract given to every man. You're infused with the most powerful compound for physical power, energy, productivity, dopamine, but we lose it if we don't keep it to the rules. What would be rule number one? I would say number one. Dr. Bakri is on a mission to help men overcome the challenges of the modern world. From boosting testosterone to optimizing sleep, he is always on the cutting edge of the latest health research. You know, a lot of people are not going to agree with what you're saying. I know. That's fine. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of the Prophetic Mentality Podcast. I'm your host, Amr Mabrook, joined by my co-host Munir with a very special guest, Aboud Bakri. Assalamu alaikum, Aboud. How are you doing? For those of you guys that don't follow the most base doctor in all of Orange County, Aboud is an internal medicine doc. He's on the cutting edge of all different kinds of research topics, um, ideas that, I mean, he's someone that I wish I'd met years ago before I turned 30, because I feel like after I turned 30, everything just took a nosedive health-wise. And mashallah, he's been introducing me to concepts, ideas, protocols that, you know, are kind of reinvigorating uh, from, you know, re reinvigorating me physically, spiritually. So these are the kind of topics we're going to be discussing today. <coughs> Weight loss for men, uh, how, to, how to maintain your testosterone levels, how to maintain that high energy level, that virality. Um, so yeah, we're going to take it away. Uh, first thing is, you went viral on Twitter for this long post you put out, and it's called the Testosterone Covenant. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so Bismillah. The Testosterone Covenant. The Testosterone Covenant. It's, it's a contract given to every man, right? So let's imagine this, you're 13, 14 years old, you're under the auspices of your mom, you're getting a comfortable life, everything's great, and then bam, you're hit. Puberty hits you, and suddenly you're infused with the most powerful compound for physical power, mental power, energy, productivity, dopamine, everything. It's testosterone. You're hit with this unlimited supply. It's good. The highest it's ever going to be in your life is when you're hitting puberty. And as long as you maintain the rules that come with this covenant, you get to keep a high level of testosterone. The moment you break down and stop following the rules that come with this covenant, testosterone is pulled away from you. And you stop having this vitality, this virility, this power that comes with the testosterone. Now, this is something that men have over women. Like it's the unfair advantage that we get, but we lose it if we don't keep to the rules. So we get this unlimited infusion of this powerful substance. And it can change societies. It can change your life. It could make you the best version of yourself. And if you don't follow the rules, no testosterone. And I feel like a lot of people aren't following these rules because... Nowadays, I see a lot of advertisements, a lot of social media buzz about getting, you know, hormone replacement therapy delivered right to your home. Right, right. And um, so it's like always a huge topic in men's health, men's fitness discussions. Um, you know, why is testosterone so low? And it's to the point where even women are talking about it because it affects their relationships, you know, with men in their life. Right. right? So, you know, if you if your husband is weak, if your, you know, whoever your, your welly is not someone who's taking care of you right. because they're just. The, the, they don't have that in them, you know, how can we go about addressing these things? Now, is this something that, like, can we talk a little bit about the rules? Like, what would be rule number one? <coughs> yeah. The, yeah, not just, to touch on what you said first, not just how powerful or how good their will your spouse is, what spouse they would like. Because remember, testosterone, it influences your choice in mate, mm. your, your pheromones that come out of your body, um, how you are masculinized visually and all these things. They will influence the choice in mate. And then we can get into later on what birth control and these other things change the way a woman will perceive a man. Mm. But you know, to, to answer your question about the different rules when it comes to testosterone, I would say num number one, you have to live and die with the sun. So if you think about it, the female rhythm is more like the moon, where it's a 28 day cycle. It, every phase of the cycle looks different. There's different hormones, estrogen, progesterone, um, different cycles of, of different hormones. While the male cycle is very similar to the sun in that it rises every morning and it sets every night. And it's a 24-hour cycle. We have a, a diurnal rhythm testosterone. Testosterone is made right before you wake up. And if you're a young man, you probably remember this. And if you're still keeping the testosterone covenant, you will remember this because you wake up every morning and your testosterone says hi to you in the form of morning erections, morning wood. Now, your testosterone is highest in the morning. That's when you're most vital, most powerful, most energetic. And then it fades away at night to allow you to go into sleep to recuperate for the night. So you have to live and die with the sun. 
That means getting sunlight in the morning, uh, going out, um, working hard in the presence of sunlight. And this is also a concept backed up by the Quran. And you have to rest in the darkness of night. Now, if you don't respect this diurnal variation between night and day, you're setting yourself up for a low testosterone state. Because testosterone must be made with high vitamin D levels, high sunlight exposure, and very deep recoverative sleep at night. And if those two things aren't there, testosterone's gone. So you're saying you're doing your best... <clears throat> You're doing your best every morning to get out in the sunlight. Yes. And work in the sunlight. And work in the sunlight. Whatever it is, either if you're studying something yes. or if you're doing a physical workout, going for a walk, whatever it is, you're trying to be in the sunlight. Yeah. And you want, you want to live, live your life accordingly to the variation of the sun. Yeah. And this is an Islamic concept because we are already set up to do that. Like yeah. we should all be like when someone asked me, is it, is it Asr time? Is it Luha time? I'm like, why are you looking at your phone? You should be able to know by the sun. Yes. Yes. You should be able to. Look at the sun, look at your shadow, and calculate. So, you know. Yeah, and I, I would say if you were to live the most ideal lifestyle to a testosterone state would be to live like a mu'adhan. Because hmm. a mu'adhan must every day see the sunrise, must go outside at the whole time and see the sun past the zenith, so that mm -hmm. then the whole time is when the vitamin D levels are highest, must go outside again to see if their shadow is, is um, also time, and then must see the sunset for maghrib. Praise Asha goes home and sleeps early, Right, because they have to wake up and call at that at treasure time. They have to be awake before. Yes. And if you, if you notice this, if you calibrate yourself to the sun and you sleep right after Ashat and you saw the sunset and then you will naturally wake up an hour before Fajr. No alarm clock needed. Today I woke up. There was no alarm clock needed. I actually woke up. I always have a backup alarm. I woke up 10 minutes before it. And for the listeners, Abud actually follows this, by the way. He's not all talk. Like, I think we were trying to meet up one night. And it was like 8 p.m. He's like, bro, I got I to gotta go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost bedtime for me. <laughs> I was like, come on, man. <laughs> I, I mean, here, here's the thing. You either have to follow the, the laws of nature <laughs> that Allah has put down for us, or you're going to end up following the laws of man and getting injections of testosterone. It's yeah. really that simple. Like, if you want to maintain this natural reserve of energy and power, you must follow the rules that are set down. Yeah, and I think, it, it, I think it gets really difficult at night because if you're working at yes. nine five and then you yeah. have to go home spend time with your family, and then you, <clears throat> a lot of us have other work that we have to do, and then you're you're, we're not by candlelight, we're not no. using um, incandescent bulbs, we're using these very. Hi, powerful. Oh, come on, this is, yeah, nice. <laughs> this is nice. This is great. No, this is great. <clears throat> yeah, we're using these um, these uh, really strong LEDs, blue light, with blue light, right? And and blue light is one of the the worst things you can not just expose your eyes to, but actually your skin, mm -hmm. right? And a little known fact about LEDs is that the more accurate they get, as the technology becomes better and better over the years, and it they become really color accurate, mm -hmm. it's because they're actually able to like really make the blue wavelength mm -hmm. super strong. So as they get more accurate, the worse they are for you. You're like, oh, this looks nice, but you feel like crap because you have all this blue so light. So for those who don't know, what, what is blue light? Like, why I see this all the time. Oh, blue light glasses. You should wear these when you go on your computer. What's all that about? Yeah, so the spectrum of visible light ranges from red to, to blue-violet, Yep. right? And then around that, you have infrared light yep. and you have ultraviolet light. So the sun spectrum that we, we see, we receive on Earth is between infrared and ultraviolet. Now, the majority of the sun's rays are in the red spectrum, and that's what gives it its color, but the sun also has blue light. So our bodies are calibrated to see blue light and associate that with alertness and make cortisol. So cortisol is, is misaligned and it feeds back into the testosterone covenant. Cortisol is, is the stress hormone, and people say that, oh, that it's yeah. a bad thing. You want high levels of cortisol in the morning, and you want low levels at night. And it's that this difference between cortisol levels that allows you to have very firm, strong awareness early and very deep sleep at night. The majority of people, their cortisol levels are sky high, 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m. So they're not able to relax. And even if they fall asleep, they're not getting reg regenerative sleep. And then they wake up feeling tired. They need three coffees to get started because their cortisol levels aren't peaking the way they should be. Mm. And the cortisol system, is it goes from the brain to the adrenal glands that sit above your kidneys. And the testosterone system is also from the brain to the gonads. These are competing, uh, competitor systems. So if one system is being pushed more than the other, it drains the other system. So if you are pushing the cortisol pathway very hard, you pull away 
reserves from the testosterone pathway because they both use the same cholesterol and the same pregnenolone to make cortisol or testosterone. They're both steroid hormones. So if you're not getting morning sun, <clears throat> you're staying up all night under mm -hmm. blue light, you're increasing your cortisol, yeah. lowering your testosterone. So you're waking up with not enough cortisol, uh, not enough testosterone because mm -hmm. you depleted it right. at night. So you feel like crap. And then that's just like a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. You have to take more caffeine to stay awake. Now you're sleeping worse at night. And you're yeah. and just a vicious cycle. You end up 30 plus and you feel unvital, unenergetic. And when I, when I notice this the most is when I, I get a lot of people's laps, sometimes <laughs> unsolicited laps. They send, hey, what do you think about my testosterone levels? <laughs> what I noticed was. Of all the things to get in someone's DMs for. <laughs> it's funny. If you see my DMs, it's, it's a bunch of. Muslim guys, hey, I need to quit pornography, and hey, how do I how do I get my testosterone levels up? But <laughs> the the biggest calamity I notice is when my father, who's in his mid sixties, has double or triple the amount of testosterone as mo than most guys that are in their twenties and thirties. Wow, that uh, that I'm seeing when it shouldn't be that way. When yeah. it should be that you're in twenties and thirties, you should be at the highest level, the, mo the peak of your life. Yeah, and it goes into this light, it goes into this circadian thing, and what I would say is that the Muslim is more vulnerable to this than anyone else because we by default have to live on a 24 hour cycle. Yeah. And we don't, we, because of work demands, because of life demands, because of being indoors all day, we shun this. And as a result, we have the consequences that we're talking about. Can you, can you recover? So I know we see a lot of graphs and says over time, testosterone is going to drop, 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 drop. But is there any way for some guy in his thirties to bring it back up to where it should have been and then yeah. decline naturally from there? Yeah. So I, I don't believe necessarily that testosterone declines as you age. What happens is you decline as you age. I decline as I age, and then testosterone declines with it. So testosterone is a marker of vitality. So the more vital you are, the more energetic you are, the higher testosterone levels will be. So if you take somebody who's 16, is living this life that we're talking about by the testosterone covenant, which we'll get into all of them, you will have somebody that is high, high energy, high testosterone, maintains their libido and drive and, and all these things. Um, while if you take somebody in their 20s and they, they shun this, it goes away. I also think our father's generation, our grandfather's generation had a better upbringing they were outside playing all day. They were, and me, I mean, we experienced this, but the generation now growing up doesn't experience this. You never see bikes outside uh, yeah. different people's house. You don't see kids playing outdoors. Kids playing outdoors is like, you, you're like, what's going on? It looks, it looks weird. It looks foreign. Yeah. It's not, it's not normal anymore. No, not at all. And yeah. it's, it's unfortunate. And, and that's why kids are having all these different problems. And I would say there's probably three critical periods in life. Uh, the first eight weeks of pregnancy, the first uh, few weeks after birth, and then the, the puberty period. And the first eight weeks of pregnancy. Yeah, that's when the brain's developed. Okay. So that, that's when a boy's brain will masculinate and a female's brain will feminize. Okay. And the first few weeks of uh, birth, actually, you'll notice that a baby has very high testosterone levels for the first few weeks of life. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it, it, I haven't put my finger on what that is. I'm trying to figure that out. But And then in puberty, um, you have a critical period where your brain will develop. And if you don't develop this, that's why you find all of these low T, very low energy guys that even if you inject them with testosterone later in life, they seem very low energy. But to answer your question, if you realign your life with the natural rhythm of, of sun and, and moon of day and night, and you give your body what it needs, yes, you should be able to, to bring back your levels. Yeah, and I, I think honestly, <clears throat> we're gonna get into the rest of them. But for that rule, I feel like you will see immediate. Mm -hmm. Like I remember the days where I just woke up early and I walked outside, like prayed Fajr, and then walk, just took a walk as the sun was rising, I didn't need coffee that day. I didn't need an energy drink. I felt so energetic. And it was within that day. Right. Yeah. You didn't have to do it for three weeks and then see results. No, you can literally try this out tomorrow. Right. And yeah. then if you multiply that by three weeks, by three months, and you do this for a long time, you naturally will not yeah. need that. Like you, you should wake up and you should be clear of mind. You shouldn't need so much caffeine to get started. Caffeine just adds more yeah. zest to life. But, and I like it. It's the line of the believers, of course. And I am on a lot of caffeine right now. But nonetheless, uh, you shouldn't need that to get started in your day. Yeah, you shouldn't wake up feeling groggy. That's not normal. No, no. No, you should wake up feeling refreshed. If yeah, you're yeah. constantly waking up feeling groggy, that's a sign that something's wrong. Right. That's, that's yeah. a circadian, calibrated, miscalibrated circadian rhythm yeah. that is hormonal, hormonal issues, that is poor nutrition, poor sleep. I mean, we're not giving our bodies our right. It's right. Yeah. And if you think about it, like yesterday on Twitter, a big post went viral, and what I was what someone had commented not Muslim guys like oh it's as if the ancient books the he was referencing the Bible um, had it right I'm like yeah it's as if the person who sent down the revelation is the same person that calibrated the testosterone system mm. so when you realize that it's the same thing that Allah has a certain plan in place for you 
and that the Islamic lifestyle actually is the most high testosterone lifestyle, you're able to set up your day and life that way. Okay. That's great. What would be the next? Yeah. Yeah. The so next one. Let's just pull up the list so we don't miss anything. So <coughs> I would say... Rise in social status? Yeah. So that's going to be a good one. Yeah. Rise in social status and excel in your field. So let, let's do a little mind experiment. You have five monkeys. Okay. Five monkeys. And you put them into a, a area. They will make a hierarchy. They will make one, two, three, four, five. First monkey beats up all the other four. Second one beats up the next three. Now you take monkey number three and you inject this guy with a ton of testosterone. What does he do? Does he compete for number one? That's what everyone answers, and except, except very few. That's what, you, that's, what, that's what intuitively you would think. Or he what, does nothing. Well, no, what he actually does is he beats the crap out of four and five. <laughs> uh-huh. Why? Testosterone helps you maintain your social standing. It is a social molecule. It is a molecule to keep your place in society. So as you rise in society, your testosterone levels rise with you to help you maintain that spot in the social hierarchy. So the problem is if you do, if you live a very boring career where you're just at a desk all day, there's no competition, there's no uh, trying to beat other men, your testosterone levels aren't needed anymore. And you think about the system, why would the body make something it doesn't need? So that would be the big one. Even like chess tournaments, like it's not a very ag- aggressive high testosterone thing where you measure people's testosterone levels before and after games, the winner has a rise in testosterone while the loser has a, a decrease. I don't know. Yeah, I can actually reflect that a little bit about my personal life because I went from like working a private job to a government job. Mm-hmm. And then you can actually see the, the difference in the people you're interacting with at work. In the private world, everyone's like gunning for the next contract, right. coming in early, leaving late. You know, the, the, they're competing to get this project. Whereas in the government world, it's like, you know, the work is coming to you. Mm-hmm. So they're more relaxed. They're like, how's it going? Right. So you, you, it really does happen. Um, I would say bureaucracy is a low testosterone uh, organization. All bureaucracies. That's why if you go to the DMV, you go anywhere, it's just a low T environment. 100%. And, and nothing gets done. And at a fundamental level, when I ask people why does testosterone exist, people will say to, for, for sex, for muscle, for this. But fundamentally, testosterone exists for you to beat other men. Yeah. It, everything it does to you helps you beat other men. You're bigger, you're stronger, your bones are stronger, your mind is clearer. You um, can uh, work harder, work longer for more yeah. time. That's what, why testosterone exists. The reason we don't we have a decreased levels of it is that people are understanding the fundamental essence of this molecule and why it's created. So the takeaway would be introduce competition in your life if you don't have it. Right. If you are in that environment, compete to succeed. Mm-hmm. If not, join something or be part of something right. that goes competitive sports, competitive jiu-jitsu, sports, jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu yeah. what, wrestling, whatever it may be that yeah. you can put where you can put yourself at a place where you may lose or win to an equal man. Yes, because if you if you're just getting beat up by someone stronger than you, or you're beating up someone weaker than you, there's not that competition. It has to be someone at your level that you're feeling that need to compete. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And not video games. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you know, video, video games. You're indoors or yeah. late at night under blue light, not getting yeah. activity. You want you want that aggression to be in a physical state as well. Yeah, agreed. And yeah, we were touching on this with, with the other podcast that we've done related to the topic. It, like, it's so important to have a group of guys around mm-hmm. you. Like-minded, uh, uh, maybe in this similar social circle, so social sphere, right? These are the guys that can kind of, they're your friends, they're there to support you, but at the same time, you do have that little bit like, what are you doing? What am I doing? Like, how can you, you know, b- better each other like that? So um, being part of those groups is really, really important for Definitely. the average man. Yeah. Uh, steel, sharp and steel. Yes. As I say, and if you don't have that, uh, especially growing up, like these youngsters, they, they're not hanging out with other men, and that's leading them to be very dull. Yeah. On a physical and a mental level. Agreed. Okay, next point. I think the next point, it, it's interesting, actually, I think you kind of brought it in already, it was competing with people at your level, yeah, yeah, at yeah. your standing, right, yeah. right. as opposed to up and down. Or yeah, because if you're just getting beat up, yeah. <laughs> you're just going to be you'd be depressed. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Someone's like uh, 100 pounds over your weight class, like what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, and, and to put a, a bow on that, like the number two was to uh, rise in social standing. For an animal, the only way to rise in social standing is by physical aggression. You must defeat the other lion physically. But human beings, we have multiple pathways to rise in status, whether that's financially, whether that's becoming the local imam, whether that's becoming um, famous famous on a podcast or Uh, something, going going (laughs) viral for for your last few (laughs) podcasts. That will enhance your ability in social standing. So we have multiple ways. That feeds into your brain to tell your brain to make more testosterone, and that helps you maintain that circuit. Yeah. That, there's a there's a circuit that's going around where winning raises testosterone, testosterone raises winning, 
And you must keep that cycle going to the day you die. Yeah. Otherwise, m- m- well, most guys, somewhere along that, p- that cycle, it breaks down and they're no longer on that hamster wheel, we call it. Yeah. And there are good ways to do this and bad ways to do this. Right. So the good ways to do this are like all the stuff we just talked about. Mm. Physical competition, uh, um, being part of men's groups, sh- steel sharp, sharp and steel. The bad way to do it would be like the Western mindset, which is like you show off your trophy wife. Right. Right. That's like low T energy. You don't want to do that. You get married. Like as a man, you want to be protecting of your women, not mm-hmm. like, look what I got. You know, you can't get her. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's funny because it's, it's all trying to flex on other men, but there's better ways to flex yeah. on guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like giving access to better things. It, yeah. it's, it's interesting. It's phenomenal. I mean, this, this society now is a low-T society. Yeah. And you can actually look in history and figure out which societies are the highest T. And as the testosterone levels on average throughout the society drop, you see that society flounder both intellectually and physically. Yeah. Because testosterone is the great dopaminergic organizing power of the mind. It allows the male mind to be very structured, focused on tasks and goals. Mm-hmm. So if you imagine the Mongols invading the Muslim lands, the Muslims were at a low point in testosterone at that point. Mm. I mean, I think a good percentage of the population of the Muslim world was high. Like marijuana was, was being very, very really. Yeah, there's like there's a there's PhD thesis on on the marijuana usage, in, for example, in Egypt. Interesting. Where, where, where people have tried to get people off of marijuana, but they've been smoking. While the Mongols are this very aggressive, uh, high tea society, drinking the, the blood of horses, which. Is is whatever it is, but they enter in and they raid your your town. They destroy you. Yeah. And then uh, Genghis Khan was <coughs> taking different herbs that boost testosterone. And all, and all what are those herbs? Uh, Sistanch. It's it's the favorite famous uh, Eastern herb. It's supposedly supposed to make you more virile. Is that like masculine. the tree root? What's it called? Um, there's one. Uh, I forget what it's called. You were talking about it, actually. Which like one? Tree. Ta- 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 Ali or whatever. Yeah, that one. Yeah. That one. Those are marginally effective. I know, I know Huberman made them popular, but... I know, I know. I feel like some of this stuff is a little like snake oil. I don't know. Here's the thing. At a baseline <coughs> level, testosterone is not about consumption. It's about production. If it, uh, look at the way we're created. The penis is outside the body. The vagina is inside. The uterus, rather. The, the penis, or the man, releases his fluid. The woman accepts it. So the man is by default productive. The female is consumptive. So if you think you're going to consume something that's going to make you more of a man, that's by default epistemologically wrong. Because mm. the, the masculine is the act of doing, while the female is the act of consuming. So that in a very hyper-consumptive world that we live in, that's why we have low T levels. You actually were talking about this to me off podcast, how even the conversation around how you should increase your testosterone is actually a low testosterone conversation. Yeah. Because it's like, you need to take this supplement and you need to you know right. follow this little protocol here and, and then you know do this little injection. It's like, no, it should really be about mindset first. You do it, and then the body will follow. Right. Right? It's, it's mindset, and on top of that, when people ask me, how do I raise my testosterone? I'm like, why is your testosterone low to begin with? You are a 25-year-old dude. Your testosterone should be raging high. Yeah. There should be no problem in your testosterone system. You were created to have high T. Yeah. The only times in history, and, and I reverse engineered testosterone to really understand this, and I haven't heard this spoken about publicly, is that why would testosterone ever be low? There's about four things I would say testosterone w- would be low for. Number one, if you're in a high stress, high cortisol state, for example, you're being invaded by another tribe or something's going on and you need to run away. There's no purpose for you to have high testosterone to compete against other men or to, to, to have intercourse. So your body will naturally lower your testosterone levels. Number two is if you're in a high consumptive state, hmm. right? So let's say you're, you're a warrior, you're coming back from conquest, you come back into, into town, um, you get to now rest and relax and you don't want to be in that high aggression state. Number three would be if your nutrient level is very low. So if you're not consuming enough food, your body will, will shift the resources away from testosterone into other things. And um, number four is if you're not sleeping sufficiently because that suggests that you're under a high stress state. So it kind of goes back to number one. The problem is that most obese men nowadays, at the level of their brain, fundamentally, their brain thinks they're starving because there's a hormone called leptin. And we'll get into that when we talk about you know, weight loss and obesity. There's a hormone called leptin that exists in the fat cells and gets sent up to the brain. that tells your brain that you're satiated. So when you're starving, that those levels go down. Ironically, when you are very obese and you've been obese for a long time, leptin levels get very high to the point where your brain rejects leptin. and says, hey, I don't want to respond to the signal anymore. So fundamentally, the person that weighs 350 pounds and the person that weighs 100 pounds and hasn't ate for three months, at the level of the brain, they exist very similarly. Um, okay, well then, uh, 
the next point, I think it was funny. Is like you're naturally going into the next one. Allow recovery time and darkness at oh, yeah. night, and then allow your body to heal. Right. So, so a lot of guys are like, I don't need sleep. I don't need to. I don't. I can just keep going. Everything. Sure, that's cute. But your body needs to recover. It needs the time to assimilate the information that you've made. It needs time to build the muscle that you've you've trained. It needs time to make those hormones in the depth of night. And the darker your night is, and the brighter your day is, the bigger this juxtaposition, the better this process ha- is allowed to happen. You, you were mentioning the problem today is we wake up and it's darker than no, yeah, it's darker than than at nighttime when right. it's bright. When it's bright, especially with all the lights in your house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the body's you're being you're telling your body, hey, I'm waking up right now, even right. though it's like 10 p.m. Yes. And then when I woke up, there were no lights on. It was really dark, and your body's like, oh, I should be sleeping right now. It's really gro- now Yeah, you have the groggy. you have the 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 blackout curtains. Right. Yeah. You know, you're, you're on your phone. Scrolling. You're on your phone scrolling. Right. It, it's no. It doesn't look any different than you going to sleep. Right. That's and that's like that's not good. No. And that, what I tell people is compare the first 90 minutes of your day and the last 90 minutes of your day. Yeah. And if the last 90 minutes are brighter and more intense in light than your first 90 minutes, you have a giant problem on your hands because you're confusing your body. Because remember, every cell in your body runs on a clock. They even call it a gene clock. They give it a cute name, so it's an acronym that goes into it's called clock. And if this oh, rhythm... Oh, it spells out clock. Yeah. Oh. You know, scientists are <laughs> kind of cute. <laughs> but they have a perfect rhythm, every cell in your body. And if this rhythm runs well through the body and the, the main setter of this rhythm is light, now, food, exercise, temperature are secondary setters of this rhythm, mm-hmm. but the main setter of the rhythm is light. And if the light from head to toe is well calibrated, everything runs smoothly. But if it is miscalibrated, this is when metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and all these diseases of modernity start setting in. And it's kind of funny because online you'll go and you see that what's the cause of diabetes? People will say it's fat, it's carbs, it's seed oils, it's this, it's that. When the reality is the reason none of them can come to consensus is that they're barking up the wrong tree. It's right there. It's light. The cause of diabetes is light. Light, bright light at night causes the insulin signal to be miscalibrated to when you eat. You know, a lot of people are not going to agree with what you're saying. I know. That's fine. You're going to talk about your A1C levels, yeah. blood sugar levels. Yeah, but if you have a poor light diet, you miscalibrate your, your metabolic system at the fundamental level, from the mitochondria, from the leptin level, and you will have dysregulation, you will end up eating more, you'll be hungrier all the time, you'll end up eating more food, you'll, your metabolic rate will be compromised, and you'll and eventually develop metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and so on and so forth. This is, you're talking about type 1 and type 2? No, type 2. Just type 2. Type 1 is auto, autoimmune disease. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, just want to make sure we're clarifying. Yeah, that. yeah, that's good questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, do you have a suggestion for what kind of lights you would have in the house at night then? Yeah, so what, what I would tell people is, uh, it is hard in the modern society to get around this light problem without looking like a freak, right? <laughs> You're gonna have red lights at night. You can, you, you might look romantic, but it's not gonna work for the mo- majority of people. So to offset that, you want the, the very bright light during the day and kind of offset the problems that you're having in, at night. But what you want is number one: don't be, the, don't have the last thing you see before you sleep. Your phone. If you're just getting this blue light right into your eyes, that's a problem. Like my, my phone, I have it on the red mode, so that it doesn't have any of that blue light, but you want to dim the lights. So if you're going to have the same amount of light, if it's dimmer, that's better. You want, um, unfortunately, there's an incandescent light bulb anymore. We have these LED lights. If you can have yeah, incandescents. You, actually, you can't get these incandescents. Yeah. Yeah. There's people who sell them on the black market. It's like a black market thing now. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> I incandescent light bulbs. But you, you want to have uh, less... less Candle light. Uh, candle, and sun, and sun, and, uh, yeah. candle and fire light would be the most ideal. Yeah. If you can get that. Um, the closer it is to red hue, the better. So if you have those hue light bulbs, you can make yeah. it yellow, orange, red. You that. can actually get some of these adjustable ones where you can change the color temp. So in the morning, you're at 5,600 Kelvin, which is yes. sunlight. And then in the evening, you can go down to 2,700, which is like a very warm light, and you can dim it. That'll be a lot better on your system. And you can install those on your laptop too, where it automatically makes your screen. There's an app called F.Lux. Yes, yes, yes. So all these, all these little things that you can introduce in your life that will just naturally reduce the amount of blue light. Because it's not just about wearing the glasses. Yeah. The glasses is for your eyes, but it also affects your skin. Because you have melanopsin in your skin. Yeah. That's um, examining your levels of light. There's even now what they're calling a skin gonadal axis. There's an axis between your skin and your testicles where your skin is sensing how much light there is, how much um, vitamin D you're making, how much UV exposure you have, and communicating to your brain and to your, to your gonads to make testosterone or not to make testosterone. 
So you say those blue light glasses aren't going to do the trick. They will marginally help, but it's not going to undo everything that you. If you're like you're blasting in, in you're in Qamari at night and you're blasting light and you're wearing your glasses, good luck. <laughs> Fair enough. But if you're like, if I'm just on my laptop at night, it's so it, the rest it, of my it would be better. Yeah. Exposed. I yeah, mean, it would yeah. be better than not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the data isn't clear if this is going to be a big effect because every, the the main scientific field hasn't caught up to this light idea. Yeah. They're still talking about food and they're talking about all these things. Like if you look up the consensus guidelines on how to fix sleep, the word sunlight is not even mentioned in the guideline, which is pathetic, to say the least. When this is the key regulator of your circadian clock. Yeah, and the thing about food is it's like it's one of those sciences that's constantly changing. Right. I feel like every five, ten years it's like a new wave, a new uh, a new idea of what we should be eating or what we shouldn't be eating. Grandma right. knows best, that's what I always say. Yeah. Grandma knows best. Whatever your grandma or maybe your great grandma nowadays, since some of our grandmas aren't the best shape, whatever she told you to eat, and it was uh, culturally appropriate for you, and seasonally appropriate. So if that's you a bit, yeah, another thing. Yeah. If you notice, like my grandma would always bring out dried figs and tahini in the winter, hmm. and that uh, tahini is actually a thermogenic, and the, the figs that gives you the, the sugar, so you're actually re- able to raise body temperature in the winter, while in the summer you shouldn't be eating that. In the summer, you should be eating watermelon and fruit that's available locally, yeah. right? So, like, th- there's wisdom in the way our um, ancestors lived. And there's greatness in the modern medical system. And if you can fuse these two together, you have a very robust health. The problem is the majority of people either want to follow this or that and don't want to look into where the crossover happens. Yeah. And I feel like that's where really a lot of the, a lot of the, un, um, the undiscovered uh, wisdom you, you can get in right. the, in the, at that intersection. Yeah. Okay, but what uh, have you heard of the theory that humans actually should be on two sleep cycles? So they do one sleep. And if you think about like the Prophet said, I mean, the generation, they all slept, they'd wake up at Fajr, stay up, but then they'd always have that na- nap around Dhuhr time. Yes. So what do you say to, because like, yes, we are like sleep deprived a bit, but like how much sleep is enough? And especially in our lives where we only get like one sleep, what should that entail? The sleep that you just described is the most biologically consistent. And if you were to give a circadian rhythm, scientists, the Prophet Muhammad's life, remove his name so they don't have any bias and let them study his life, they would say this is the most circadian calibrated individual in history. End the podcast there. But no, um, <laughs> the, the reality is, cut. <laughs> yeah, the cortisol levels rise very sharply uh, within two hours of, of waking up and they dip down at Dhuhr time when the sun is brightest. So this is the perfect window to recover and take a, take a nap. And the way I set up my days, I have two days in one. So I have Dhuhr to uh, Fajr al Dhuhr and then Qailula and I have Asr to Ashat. And those are my two days. So I can get more done in that day. Um, you're going to say something funny. No, 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 no. <laughs> this, I heard this before. I, have, I live two days. I li- you yeah. know, in one week, I have two weeks. <laughs> yeah, no, th- some of those guys that, that say that, they're on amphetamines and TRT and all these things. So, so it's a little bit. <laughs> yeah, like, they're I'm talking about naturally, <laughs> na- without getting cracked out, without doing freaking speed. This is how you can live your life <laughs> with, with um, and if you think about it, the Prophet Sallallahu would, would do his main uh tasks for the day after Fajr, if he was sending out an army, if he was doing any kind of major uh, event, it would be early in the day. And then after after Asad, he would attend to his family, take care of different issues, because you're a little bit lower on dopamine, lower testosterone at that time, so you can take care of more of the household affairs. But early in the day, you should be like very robustly focused. And the reason a lot of people have this dip of energy and they, they go for the second cup of coffee is because they're not getting that nap. So at least five to ten minutes, if, if not more, you would need that. Now, that would depend on the season. So if it's wintertime and you're sleeping from, like some people here, 8.30 to 4.30 a.m., right? You wouldn't need that qailula because you got eight hours of sleep at night. But in the summertime, when, when you only have six hours of sleep between Asha and Fajr, yeah. then the qailula becomes very effective. So that, that's the ideal time to do it because the cortisol levels are low. Because, it, like, it's funny. The scholars for, for a thousand plus years have said that sleep right after Asha is worth double the points. Sleep uh, after Fajr is worth negative points and sleep after Asr is worth negative points. And that is circadianly consistent. While sleep after Dhuhr and sleep at night is worth the most amount of points. And even if you try this in your own life, if you are calibrated to the circadian rhythm and you sleep after Asr, good luck sleeping at night. So this actually goes back to what you're saying about being tied with the sun. Because I feel like if you're naturally in tune with what's going on and you listen to your body, you'll know if I need this nap or I don't need this nap. Yes. Now it's naturally a good time to go to sleep. Your body has internal regulators that are communicating with you what you should and shouldn't do. Right. Um, but when 
your what you're consuming and what you're executing on is totally messed up, you're messing up those regulators, mm -hmm. right? So if you're in tune, then you should be just more naturally like, okay, you know what? I think a five, 10 minute nap, I'd be really refreshed. Mm -hmm. You go for it. You're not just always, oh, I need a nap. I'm always tired. No, there's like a, there's a difference. Right. And the reason people are always tired is because they don't have this nice rhythm that yeah. sets up their day because their body fundamentally is what I tell people is you are lost in time. Yeah. So I call them lost time travelers. They're in jet, they have jet lag, even though they haven't traveled in weeks. For example, if from Monday to, to Friday, you're waking up at 7 a.m. and sleeping at 10 p.m. Yeah. And then on the weekend, you are waking up at 10 a.m. and sleeping at 1 a.m. It's like you went to New York, yeah, hung out there for a weekend, and then flew back. So your body is lost in time. You literally jet lagged yourself. Yeah, and yeah. fundamentally, fundamentally, the <laughs> biggest victim of this is the Muslim. That is the practicing Muslim. Why? Because the practicing Muslim, they sleep late, and then they wake up early for Fajr, and they go back to sleep. So their light, their body has seen light from from you know when they're making wudu, they've gotten wet, wet water, cold water on their face, and then they go and they're supposed to wake up somewhat to pray Fajr at least, and then they go back to sleep in a high cortisol state. That is a problem, and then their rhythm's all broken, and that's why you you notice there's a obesity problem amongst Muslims, amongst everybody. But how about in Ramadan? Do you suggest because Suhoor is like really early, right? And the people play Fajr right away, and then they want to go back to bed, especially like in the summer times. What I in, my, in my Ramadan book, I had I'd given out like all the possible options of what you could do. The ideal would be to do that biphasic sleep, where you sleep from Asha to Fajr and then sleep again um, between Dhuhr and Asr. Ideal. But the reality is some people are surgeons, some people are, have very demanding jobs. So if you have to sleep after Fajr, you do your thing. And Ramadan is one month of the year. But for the rest of the year, you have to be able to live according to the sun rhythm. Now, if you live in like Finland or Norway where it's very hard, that's a different conversation. I'm talking about the majority of people. Yeah. <laughs> they kids are to California, they right? They kids are to California. <laughs> we get a lot of sun here. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we don't use it. Like we, we should have the most robust health Yeah. because we have sunlight in the winter. California Muslims should be like, we should be on the sun, man. We should be lit with the sun. But. Yeah. And, and it's not just about like having the sun. We, we would have higher dopamine levels, higher testosterone levels, yeah. more focused, more motivated, more able to do the things that you need to do. And fundamentally, we're like we're low dopamine, low testosterone state. I, I hate to say this, I, I walk into the Jumma Khutbah and I look around, and I see like the young kids, they're like dull. Like you can see that they look ten years older than they actually are, and they look very unrobust. And they have pencil necks, and they're not strong, and they look pathetic. And this is the problem. Have you noticed that now? When, for me at least, when I go into a masjid and there's kids there, they're not rowdy anymore. No. They're not, they're not, they're not fighting. There's no, there's no intermale competition. Yeah, I never walk in and see kids just like wrestling or fighting or, you know. Good point. You know, like usually you'd always hear like the khatib, like, you know, someone quiet those kids. That doesn't happen anymore. The kids are just sitting there. No, they're on their, <laughs> they're on now, their nowadays I, I pull into the message and people are, have their AirPods in and they're on their phones. Oh, that's why well, I've seen that one. Because <laughs> like literally they're being doled by this device. So how Instead of having this vitality where they're able to actually fight with other kids. They don't kids. have to hire babysitters anymore. The kids just. You know, <laughs> and, and then I, I would say that's child abuse. Like what we're doing to our kids where we're just giving them iPads and sit down and, and just be quiet. That's a form of child abuse because that kid needs to be out in the sun and, and fundamentally getting their needs met. Yeah. Like the, these plants need photosynthesis at a, at a basic a fake level. plant, but. No, bro, it's real. <laughs> now, at a fundamental level, we have something similar to photosynthesis. We are dependent on the sun. That's why Allah says in the Quran, Now, if you approach that ayah from a circadian perspective, we created the day and the night as two signs. And we erased the light or the sign of the night, and we created the sign of the day to be very bright so that you may seek the boundaries of Allah and that you know the number of years and the hisab, the calculation, right? And beyond that, you may, we may be able to extrapolate that that calculation is the internal calculation of the circadian clock because if you don't have the light, you don't have that setter. That's, they call it a zeit giver, time giver. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, I mean, every time we go down a point, it just goes back to light. <laughs> Every time we're going down a point, it's like, get with the sun, get with the sun. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like when it, when Allah nur samawat wal ard, yeah, there's profound meaning there. Yeah, that was the light of the heavens and the earth. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, actually, again, you seem to naturally transition. Number five, <laughs> seek nutrients from uh, through ancient wisdoms, and then you have a bunch of emojis like shrimp, meat, butter, milk, honey, fruits. Yes. So you eat a diet that is consistent with the season and consistent with your cultural habits that is an unprocessed unrefined diet so fundamentally 
keep saying that word. One of the biggest causes of, of low testosterone levels is obesity. So if you think about it, if you are obese, you are telling your body, there's no need to make testosterone. The resources are plentiful. There's no reason to go and compete against other men for resources. Yeah. You are in a good state. Yeah, but Uber it, eats. Yeah, take it easy, buddy. So when you are over-consuming, and it goes back to the masculine-feminine dichotomy we made, overconsumption is feminine. And a female should be a little bit towards a higher body fat percentage so they're able to last through pregnancy, while a man should be lean. So if you think about that, if a man is leaving his village, town, whatever it is, and going out to hunt, to go out on an expedition, whatever it may be, they naturally will get leaner. It's uncomfortable. Their testosterone levels will go up so that they can now compete and get kill the deer, or whatever it may be. Yeah. But if you're eating a junky processed food diet that's very convenient, very high in, nutri- high in uh, macronutrients, low in micronutrients. So the standard American diet, SAD, sad, <laughs> is very sad because it is, at the same time, you are overnourished and undernourished. You are overnourished. It's a lot of calories. Calories, carbs, and fats. Yes. Very low on vitamins and minerals and nutrients and all those things. Yeah. So you'd want to eat. Uh, I say use the sort of Muhammad uh, protocol. Mm. Talk to me. Milk, water, honey, fruit. fruit. We'll avoid the wine for now. <laughs> <laughs> and then meats. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll pr- let's bring some practicality into it. Yeah. A lot of some places where you can get some of these things. You can now go to Costco Business Center and get some of these really high quality, grass fed, mm-hmm. uh, pasture raised Australian meats that are halal. Right. You know, you gotta you gotta get the freezer space to buy in bulk. You know, watch a few YouTube videos on butchering so you can, uh, you know, carve up your meat, <laughs> and then you can have some really good quality meat for you at a really yes. really like uh, um, a really good price. Uh, get some really high quality butter. Right, right. If you have a local butcher that you can get like some beef fat and you can run it down, run it on a beef tallow. That's like really good healthy fats. Mm-hmm. You can get some of that Irish gold, sherry gold sure. uh, butter. That stuff is really good. Do not buy the American. Buttercrab. That's like that stuff is infused with. Which um, I can't believe it's not butter, but that, yeah, that's not even tra- trans fats and that, complete garbage. Yeah, and we're gonna piss off a lot of our, our fellow Muslim doctors. They're gonna be like, "You're telling people to eat butter and meat. That's bad for heart disease." No, no, no not at all. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very complicated topic to even go down. Which I don't think it's even worthwhile to even do that. The fundamental fact is that the butter is rich in di- vitamin A and different yeah. vitamins and nutrients and it's better than eating the processed foods that we're getting out in public yes yes 100 percent. so you need to eat what i say is meats vegetables uh fruits uh lower carb than is traditionally done unless it's like coming from fruits yeah like like even potatoes eating potatoes avocados uh, dates dates are great honey yeah so i I eat a lot i eat maybe 250 or 300 grams of carbs a day but those carbs are coming from honey dates fruit yes potatoes and those kind of things rather than eating you know, breads, McDonald's, breads uh, all McDonald's. these things. BDS list, come on. Bro. I know. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people might have not been convinced by the BDS, but now they're convinced by the health effects. I don't know, man. Yeah. And also you're like high strung on coffee. Yeah, always. Uh, always. <laughs> high metabolism. High metabolism. <laughs> I'm, I'm like this without coffee. Coffee actually kind of allows me to speak a little bit calmer. Oh, really? To depress it for you, huh? <laughs> If I don't have coffee, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. I, I just become. <laughs> All right. Which actually, again, leading in number six, fight the desire for unrestricted consumption that leads yes. to the destruction of the sacred vessel of the body and the robbing of testosterone production capability, i.e. obesity. Yes. Obesity is, is, the, is the big problem there. Um, on top of that, um, there are three check mechanisms that exist in the body to lower testosterone because the body is always smart. That's, that's, what the, that's the perspective that modern world doesn't approach biology from if the body is smart for us as a muslims we approach it that way because we realize the body was created by the ultimate creator of the heavens and earth so we understand there is a brilliance to the structure of the body so there are three mechanisms to lower testosterone estrogen prolactin and opioids so if you are in high obese state we touched about that a little bit earlier yep. if you are uh, chronically fapping and watching tons of pornography if you are um, constantly in a, in a state of enjoyment with high opioid production endogenously or exogenously. A lot of our Muslim brothers and sisters are taking opioids. The opioid epidemic is not sparing the Muslim population. Really? Yes. We should talk to some of the shiuch and ask them how many consults they get. Hey, my son is addicted to fentanyl. My son's addicted to heroin. What should I do? Yeah, that's 
Yeah, yeah, Latif is the, is the only answer. I mean, many Janazes you hear are like, oh, the 18 year old kid, 19 year old kid died. They don't mention what it is, but if you dig in a little bit, it's an opioid overdose. So I'm just taking it as like, you know, a sign of the end of times, you know, you're better death. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a problem. Like, that's, you're, telling, you're telling me it's like opioid related. I mean, people aren't really going to dig up the coroner's report, but that's what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. And, and here's the problem. Some of these kids, they're not druggies. Some of these kids might be like, hey, I need to take some Adderall so I can study for my test so I can impress my parents, right? And then it gets laced with some other crap. It's raced with fentanyl. They haven't been exposed to it. Take one pill, gone, overdose. Yeah. It is really one of those things that um, you, once and done, like it's, yeah. not, it's not something you can flirt with. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. the, the, the dosages are so high. It's not just a little bit of oxycodone. It's fentanyl. It's heroin. It's highly laced. Yeah. Someone nefariously is doing this, and that's the consequence. But to go back to the testosterone covenant, unrestricted consumption, yes. unrestricted pleasure yeah. leads to the low testosterone. The, the testosterone state, remember, is to raise your ability to compete against other men for resources. Mm -hmm. If resources are abundant, you're telling your brain, back off. And that we live in, we live in the Western Western lifestyle, it's very, very comforting. Yes, right? hyper consumptive. You can order something on Amazon and it shows up the next day. You right. can get on Uber Eats and get whatever you want delivered to your house. You don't have to go out and get groceries. Nope. You don't have to do anything, right? And you know, if you they're talking about UBI, right? You're gonna have right. money just delivered to you now. You literally just you're gonna become like you know Wally. You remember Wally, mm -hmm. the Disney movie? Um, we're literally becoming Wally, right. right? That whole movie. So. You have to introduce competition in your life, especially if you're a man. So if you're going to the gym, right. you got to have a gym plan. Uh, if you're doing some sort of martial arts, mm -hmm. right? Um, even if it's like waking up early, making wudu with cold water, and like going to the masjid. Right. You Memorize gotta, the Quran. Yeah. But there should be this desire. I don't know. I don't get it. Like as Muslims, we should have this desire to wake up every morning and conquer the day. Like once you fix your testosterone, your leptin, all these systems we're talking about. Yeah. I literally wake up. I want to grab someone's throat and just... <laughs> the reality <laughs> of the world... <laughs> Andrew Tate, and <laughs> I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> no, but there should be this. this, this let's go back. Rel relax, brother. <laughs> I don't want to cut you off on the road. No, I'm just kidding. No, there should be a desire to conquer and and to win. Yes, and we don't have that at yes. all. Yes, you should wake up feeling excited. Yes, there should be a yeah. desire to beat, to win, to take the next step, to be, have yeah. initiative. And here's what I will say: predictive. The society that figures this out first, that follows a testosterone covenant and allows this to spread throughout their young males, will be the society that wins. Yes. Like in the West here, we're having a fertility crisis where we're below replacement already. So the society that follows these rules, keeps testosterone high despite all the toxins that exist and all the microplastics and obesity, will be the society in 30, 40, 50 years that wins the world. And if you do look at the history of America, aside from all the political stuff, you know, you, know, you start out with the 13 colonies yes. and they got to fight for their independence. And then you have this like ongoing westward expansion, families just packing things up in their wagons and then just going across the like uncharted territory. IT behavior. Right, and then they're fighting, uh, right. you know, fighting Native Americans, you know, good or bad, whatever, whatever wherever you are on that spectrum. Mostly right. bad. Yeah. Mostly bad, but <laughs> um, Maybe all. you know, the fact that you just have like these Very families bad. with their kids and then they're just like fighting off these, un, you know, unknown what's going on, mm -hmm. that's high T behavior. Yes. Right, uh, you know, cowboys, right, right. all these, these images didn't just show up because right. they're they're cool or you know something to imitate. It's because this was what was there back then, right? So and it crosses culture. Like if we yeah. go back in the past, the Sahaba coming out of the Arabian Peninsula, running around yes. on horse throughout the world. You hear Khalid and Walid going from uh, Iraq to Syria. They, all these things happening. That's the most high T behavior that yes. exists, and they're coming out with this great focus. Uh, yeah. And what I what I noticed is that they had this unlimited energy. If you look at it, different sahaba in their stories they had this unlimited yeah, vitality the, their story stops when they died yeah like they just kept doing stuff yes. it's like he did this this and this and then he died it's like yes. wait like there was no rest mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he didn't retire there was no concept of i'm gonna retire now right you know no it was always go 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 because at a fundamental level if you are focused on a goal you can tap in to unlimited reserves of testosterone and dopamine and if you look at khalid walid or different types of sahab stories their goal, their ultimate goal, was pleasing Allah. And because you can never reach that in this dunya, you know, there's always more to do. There's always more to do, yeah. You're on this constant infusion level of high testosterone. Yeah. Not to compare between Khalid Walid and Michael Jordan, but Michael Jordan would come into a game, and he's already the best. He knows he's the best. But he'd be like, see that guy over there? He said, I can't score 40 points. Even though the guy never said that. But then he, he gets in his mind this competitive state, and he taps into this reserve yeah. of dopamine, testosterone, and different neurohormones to get into a state of competition and winning. So 
for the typical Muslim, we will never reach the spiritual state of yes. the Prophet Sallallahu We can never reach the same amount of practice mm-hmm. that he had. But if you look at his life and the daily sunnahs, there's always something for you to be able to achieve and then conquer and then go to the next one, right? So there's always something, whatever level you're at, you can pull something from the seerah and like, this is what I'm going to be at. And then eventually you, you are praying to Hajjud. Eventually you are, you know, <coughs> um, you know, uh, Memorizing the Quran, fasting yeah, whatever more, it is, yeah, becoming yeah. a leader, inspiring the next generation of youth, whatever it may be, whatever it may be. There's always something for you to 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 achieve and conquer. Yeah, definitely. Next point. Next point. Move and strengthen the body, but yes. also toughen the mind. Yes. So th- this is like ties back into what we're talking about about the gym. Yeah. We have testosterone to allow us to build bigger bodies, stronger bodies, to beat other men in competitions of aggression or in mental competitions. And we should respect that and use this tool to strengthen the body to keep the body strong. Yeah. Because what ends up happening to a lot of guys is that they end up in their 40s and 50s. They're aching. They're in pain. They trained either stupidly or didn't train enough. The 40s. Yeah. Those 30s, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, 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 that's the, the, that's, the that's epidemic. <laughs> Essentially, our, our manlyhood was sold for hyperproductivity. Yeah. The hyperproductivity of the capitalistic world was made on the sacrificial altar of our masculinity. Yeah. So that, that's the consequence that we, we have now. Yeah. And that's why you have to spend so much time trying to do this. And, and when, I, when I get people's testosterone labs, I tell them, hey, you either have to reorganize your life in a way that allows you to make your natural testosterone or get ready to use a needle, my friend. It's either you live healthily and be natty or you're going to have to use exhaustive testosterone or the third option is to have low T and have low T behavior and be a complete pathetic man. <laughs> a lose-lose. Yeah, so... I, I, it's just the reality of the modern time. And it's not easy. It's very hard to live a state of existence that is conducive to high testosterone levels with the different things that are going on. Yeah, I mean, I know we talk about these things and it's like, you know, well, sleep uh, sleep uh, earlier, uh, wake up earlier, you know, go to the gym more. And it's like, we're not discounting the fact that everyone has challenges. challenges. You have a nine to five, you have a family you have to spend time with, you have a boss, you have a whatever, that, what, what the hell's going on in your life. You You have to do certain things to maintain your bills, right? Right. So what are the answers to that? I don't know, but everyone can, what? You said kids, right? If you were healthy and kept your kids in a circadian calibrated state, they wouldn't be up, up at night waking you up. For example, melatonin crosses from the breast milk from the mother to the child. So if the mother was going out and getting sunlight, if you notice the, the houses in the middle, middle East before, they would have an inner quarters of the house. Yeah. It'll be opening, allowing the females to, to be exposed to sunlight despite the hijab and whatever else. If the mother's circadianly calibrated, that will transfer to the baby through the breast milk. And if the mother's not just giving the iPad so the baby's um, quiet, the baby will be out in the daytime working and playing, doing things. And then at night, when working, that's working, yes. Working, yeah. <laughs> working on building sand castles, <laughs> <Working>. okay? <laughs> right? They will naturally fall asleep at night and they will keep you asleep at night. But when, you're, when you damage the, the health of your kids, you're damaging your own health. Yeah. I've noticed that my kids like I mean, they wake up with the sun. So actually, I hate daylight saving because now the sun rises like 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. Like, no, my kids are going to wake up at 4 a.m. 5 a.m. or trying to get up at that <laughs> time. You know, it's pulling the blackout curlings yes. t- tighter. You're like, please. For the love of yeah, God. I think for the well-being of Muslims, we need to get care to petition California to like not stop with the daylight savings. Time. <laughs> I mean, that's something I would support care doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would be great for, for Ramadan. Yeah. 100%. Because the whole would be 530. Yeah. 430. Yeah. We could have you know, Fajr at the beach at a respectable hour. You know, that's right, right. <laughs> Fajr, Fajr Fitness Club. Shout Fajr out. Fitness Club. You know shout out. But yeah, to, to answer the question about, about moving, <coughs> there is a relationship. A lot of people say like, hey, um, movement will raise testosterone. It's more the other way around. Testosterone allows you to build the muscles, but you're respecting that you're moving, you're tiring yourself out so that when you get to, to bed at night, you can recover and sleep. A lot of people, they're like, I'm not sleeping deeply. I'm like, you did nothing all day. You've been sitting down at home, didn't go outside, didn't expend yourself mentally or physically. So don't be expecting your body to recover. From what? Hmm. So when you expend yourself in the day, like people that, a lot of people report to me that when I get my steps over 8,000, 10,000, 15,000, I sleep so much deeply at night. Because when you expend yourself, you're able to turn on the recovery mechanisms. It's yin and yang. It's like a, it's a, a juxtaposition between day and night. It's a beautiful duality. Yeah. How about the tough in the mind part? Yeah. So I, what, I, what I tell people is that you need to have a squat brain, which is when you are squatting, for example, you have 300, 400, 500 pounds on your back. And if you do not get that up, you will be pancaked. So when you have that kind of mental resiliency, 
to yeah. in the gym that translates outside of life. So the point of the gym is to take what you do in there to translate to the other 23 hours of your day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to talk about squats in general, of all the three big movements, that, that is one every man should be doing. Yeah. You need to be able to squat. Yes. So you need to go to the gym, figure out how to squat. You can get an online coach. Right. You know, uh, find someone at the gym to teach you. Right. Get some proper shoes. Learn to do the back squat. That is like one of the fundamental. One of the fundamental exercises for mental toughening. It also raises testosterone. You get big legs. Right. So all just there's nothing. There's no downside. Right. As long as you do it safely and, and healthily. Yes. There, there are videos of me uh, dropping the weight, but <laughs> the shoulder man <laughs> hit it. <laughs> But yeah, you, you, and not just that, it goes back into the competition thing. Because if yeah. you and your buddies are all going to the gym together, so now it's met, it's a group of men, and you're all squatting, and it's like, hey, he took his squat from 150 to 200, I got to take mine up too. Yeah. It's, it's this very healthy environment for competition, for masculinity, yeah. for healthy competition without trying to beat the other person up. Yeah, because they got rid of weight gyms at high school. I don't know of any high school that has weight gyms. They so have them for like the sports teams, like for the football players and but stuff. But yeah, it used, no, it used to be part of PE. Yeah, no, PE is pathetic. It used to be part of PE where you had access to the weight room. I don't think you have that anymore. PE, they were... expect you to do 10 push-ups, which for a man that's 16, 17 and has testosterone levels of 1,200 plus, that is pathetic. 10 push-ups? Yeah, you should be able to do 50 at, at, at will. For all, these, for all these young kids, I mean, the PE system is pathetic because it's, it's calibrated to the lowest denomination of society, which is the super obese, super overweight kid that is eating junk food and not active. Wow. So, 10 get, push-ups now, yeah, that I, I bet you they don't even have a push-up competition now anymore in, in, in PE like we used to have because it's, like, not fair. Oh, yeah, because competition is, like, you know, bad for kids, apparently. Yeah, and, <laughs> and that's the thing. The society is generally set up to not make you a masculine, virile, Yeah, everyone gets, a, everyone gets a participation trophy. Yeah, and that's not what raises testosterone. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. From an Islamic perspective, even if you are not winning, not the multimillionaire Chad super cool guy the fact you're competing yes and you're grateful for the, the ability to be alive and all these things you frame yourself in a way and that's why the prophet muhammad him, told us to look up to people in the dunya uh, in the deen perspectives that are better than us we, we try to achieve that and the dunya perspective we look at people that are lower than us to be grateful to be grateful and if you have this constant gratitude you wake up in the morning you feel good you're going to allow yourself to be in a hormonal state which is conducive to productivity it really just start, all starts with mindset yeah yeah it's all top down because think about it. If you can get scared or be stressed out and that can make cortisol, why wouldn't you realize that you can change your mindset and make testosterone? Because that, that went from thought to a hormonal response. To physical yeah. uh, um, output. attributes. Output. Yeah. 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 And I mean, the interesting that the competitiveness thing, so they're finding, I think we discussed a little bit with Sheikh Uthman, but there are books like by uh, Leonard Sachs, mm -hmm. for example, where he talks about how schools that set up so all male schools, especially, right. really pushes the boys. Like they'll do like split them up into two teams mm -hmm. from day one. So like everyone in the class knows that like I'm on red team or blue mm -hmm. team. Okay. And everything the entire school does is based around it's like Gryffindor, helpful puff. Like you right. get points, you get points. So everyone feels a, like even if I'm not the most uh, athletic guy, I don't want to let down everyone else. So if I don't contribute my little part, we'll lose because it's a collective, right? The averages are gonna average out. So. Everyone is always pushing themselves just because I need to make sure I'm doing better and better and better to push them out. I and mean, they all have better test scores, better averages on everything like across the board. The people are more motivated, et cetera, et cetera. These are like private schools? Yeah, typically. They, yeah, we don't have them too yeah. often now because there's a lot of uh, <laughs> legality around right. having all-male school. They'll strip away all their funding and all this other stuff. It's right. it's this fiasco in that regard. I mean, it's also interesting because in Surah uh, Mulk, so a lot of people translate it, I would say incorrectly, they say the best in action. So Allah, uh, the one who created you all to test you and see who's the best in action. That's how people translate it. But actually, probably a better translation based on the grammar is the one who is better in action, mm -hmm. which is actually very significant for a male because mm -hmm. what's happening in modern day public schools is the guy's sitting there and he's not dumb, but he looks around and goes, okay, that guy's number one, that one's number two, the girl's number three, four, I'm like 10. Eh, I'm not going to try. Because if I can't get number one, there's no there's no chance of me being number one. I'm done. Because they're all because schools only reward number one person. They get one and, two. and they get yeah exactly right. right. So he's thinking to himself like, well, it's not worth it. So I'm not gonna try. And that's where you get all these lazy kids in school. He's like, oh, if I just tried, I would have. Well, he doesn't want to try because he knows I'm not gonna be number one. It's not worth it to me. That's just yeah. like the men's mentality, right? Mm -hmm. But Allah says he's not testing you. So if that was the case, Allah's like, oh, I want to see who's the best. Why would I even try? Right. I'm not gonna be number one. I'm not even gonna be number hundred. Like <laughs> I'm doomed to fail. But Allah says who's better. 
oh, okay, in that case, like I can try and be better than you at this and right. better than you at that. And then I'm going to push myself because I want to see who's better, not the best. And that makes a significant difference in the motivation. Mm. Or more importantly, better than you yesterday. Like the, the biggest enemy is you yesterday. And you must de- continually defeat you minus one so that you can continue to rise. Because that's, that's the healthiest state to be in. It's like you're competing against yourself to be the best, best version of yourself. And that's a lot of platitudes and different podcasts will talk about that. But yeah. fundamentally, it's where it's at. Yeah. So are we going to say we the next point? The next point was uh, he, the person puts himself as number two, second, but rises up for others. Right. So, yeah, that one, you got to explain that one a little bit to me. I thought we want to be number one. Yeah, you do want to be number one. But now go to a safari in Africa and watch the gorillas. The alpha gorilla is the biggest gorilla, strongest guy. He'll, they'll come up to the road and they're about to cross the road. He will stand in the middle of the road, allow the whole pack to cross, stop all cars and traffic, and then he will cross the road. So a lot of people in this like red pill movement and all these things, they think alpha means I get me, 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 me more for myself. But the true alpha puts himself second and develops the rest of the group around him. So that what you must do first is compete and rise up and still standing to become the alpha. But once you are there, you are putting your people on your back and taking them across the road, colloquially. Yeah, yes. uh, the leader of a person is their servant. Right. I mean, when Amr al-Khattab was given the khilafi, he fell on the ground because he, he knew what the consequences of that would be. And he'd be worried about a camel that would be traveling with too much weight or whatever way it may be. Because as the alpha, you are responsible for the tribe. And that's, that's, a, that's a philosophy and identity we don't inculcate in our modern day Muslim society. Because this society here is a consumer society. Get as much as you can. Go, go to school. Beat everybody. Yes, great. But you must take the tribe with you. Yeah. I think that's also something missing, so wholeheartedly missing from like the quote unquote like red pill mm-hmm. movement, the, the manosphere, you know, the idea of the masculine man or the alpha man. It, it's exactly like you said, you got to be the strongest, you got to be the best, you got to beat everyone else up. But the, that idea of leading, the idea of protection, the idea of bringing someone uh, um, in your sphere, like mm-hmm. that you have their back, right? They can rely on you. That's not there. Right. That's not there because this carries over to you're now the leader of your household. You're protecting your wife. You're protecting your children. And it's not just a physical protection. Right. You're, you're, you're giving them comfort and protection in the world. Right. right. So you have to be someone who can rise above that. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. The, the, the men are the Qawamun, which we'll leave the translation in the comments. <laughs> Care- caretakers. <laughs> yes. responsibility. Yes. Caretakers, responsibility, yes. degree yes. over. You could say whatever you want. Right? Yes. But You're responsible. Be- 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 yeah. But Allah's preferred certain people amongst others. You can even extrapolate that what we're discussing. If you are favored with high testosterone because you were born with that, then yeah. you must now rise up and take care of the people around you. Yeah. Not everyone is going to have like super high T levels. Right. Right. But, you know, everyone can get theirs le- higher, but... With what you're given, you need to act. Yeah, and, and it's very contextual because some people can have testosterone that's lower, but they have more sensitive receptors. It's, it's very complicated to parse out that. It's not a simple, like, your testosterone is 500, his 600, therefore he has more masculine traits. You can only compare yourself against yourself because your sensitivity and your system is calibrated differently. Yeah. So it's not like, hey, let's, let's do a testosterone measuring contest. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's far more complicated than that. And there's, there's Highest one becomes sheikh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On average, if the if the tide rises, it brings up all the boats. But exactly, it shouldn't be that. Hey, my, my testosterone is seven hundred. His is six hundred. I am more masculine by default. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and not as that testosterone comes out and it amplifies whatever exists already in you. It's not it's not the on and off switch. It is the volume rocker. Mm. So if your neural network is set up in a very poor way and you add on testosterone to that, and you're just a pathetic young man that isn't doing anything, it's you're not really going to help you. It's not enhancing what's already there. Because for example, if you take um, philanthropy and inject those guys, philanthropists, and inject them with testosterone, they start donating more. Right? So testosterone enhances what already exists. When we talk about the five monkeys, testosterone took monkey number three and made him beat four and five. Because what exists was that he's higher than four and five. It didn't exist that he was better than one and two. <coughs> testosterone is a great amplifier of what it already is there. So that's why Tedbi is so important because you want to set up the man. For example, Salah, you want to teach your kids to aid hit at a 10 because you want them to be set up in a way that when they are hit with that load of testosterone from puberty, you're already amplifying a person that does pray and that takes that to the next level. Mm. So a lot of people, they, they don't develop that in their teenage years and their young, uh, you know, young adulthood. And then they have testosterone amplifying really crappy habits. I really never thought of it that way. 
as an amplification. It's an amplifier. Like even amplifier, testosterone yeah. amplifies the amygdala. It amplifies the diff- that's what the fear center of the brain. It just amplifies what's there to the next mm-hmm. level. But you have to change what's already fundamentally there. That is something that is wholeheartedly in your control. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. So that, so that a lot of people misunderstand this molecule. They're like, oh, testosterone's aggression. Actually, aggression aggression raises testosterone, not the other way around. Aggression raises testosterone. Right. Now, if you inject a very aggressive, so here's the, here's the best example. You take an animal, okay? Their aggression level is X. Let's say it's a, it's a, it's a lion, whatever animal you want. Okay. You castrate the, that lion, okay? His aggression will go down, but it won't go down to zero. And this is from the work of uh, Robert Sapolsky, a very, very great researcher on this. And you then re-inject testosterone up to about 20 to 30% of baseline. Aggression comes back 100%, back to X. Now you take testosterone to up to 100%, still at X. Take testosterone to 200%, still at X. You go three, 400%, now aggression starts rising. But in the, in the natural range, testosterone saturates very early. Okay. So aggression is more based on you than it is testosterone. You can't blame your hormones for how you are. If you are an aggressive, emotionally unstable person. You need terbia. Yes, you need terbia. <laughs> and that's why Rasulullah's so biggest so. thing was terbia on these men, that when they were unleashed on the world, you could have taken any one of the 500 guys, they could have run this, the show. Yeah. They were all fantastic individuals. Yeah. But the Sahaba, we don't even know their names. They could have run and been better than any leader we have now. 100%. So... Because they had the best tarbiya. Yes. Okay. Okay. What's Sorry. the next? What's the next one? Uh, remain unfazed and capable in the face of stress. Be anti fragile. Yes. Anti fragility. Anti anti fragility is important because what's the opposite of fragile? Most people say resilient, and this goes into the work of uh, Nassim Talib. He says that the opposite of fragile doesn't have a word in the English language because you have fragile. It's something that gets worse with with stress. You have resilient. That's something that can face stress. But we don't have a word for something that gets better in the face of stress. So when you put it under pressure, it gets better. So that's what the concept of anti-fragile is. So the essential aspect of a man mm-hmm. is that he's the foundation. He is the one that supports the whole. So he can take the stress that comes out of, at him. And we, like we talked about at the beginning, the cortisol system and the testosterone system are competing systems. So we are calibrated and hardwired for acute phases of stress. And acute stress will raise your testosterone going to the gym, competing against another man. But if you're constantly under a state of stress 24-7, that saps away your ability to make testosterone. Mm. So a lion, for example, is calm and resting most of the day. And then when he sees a zebra, he turns on, his eyes focus, and he runs and, and gets the prey, and it goes back to a rest and digest state. The problem is the modern world is you wake up, alarm clock, you feel tired, you down a coffee, a coffee or an energy drink, you get in your car, you're in traffic, you're already late, you get to work, your boss sucks, you hate your boss, you get home, your wife yells at you, and the cycle continues. And you're under high stress state the whole existence. Yeah. You don't no want to rest and recoup. Nope. So that's why you must allow yourself to have stressors, like sprints of stress, and then you pull that back. And so recovery is an important state. And it's not something that we talk about because it's just like, go, 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 go. A lot of these influencers telling you to go, 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 go are on amphetamine. They're on just, uh, TRT. They're on speed. Some of them are doing coke. <laughs> so you can't compare you to them. Yeah. And this goes back to something else we mentioned earlier in the podcast and other podcasts, the importance of having that Muslim male group, mm. right? That could be, that's your group of respite, right? Your right. group of relaxation. Um, you also get competition there, but it's also a place where you, like-minded guys can just get together and relax. Um, I think like one of the best things in the world is like when you're just with your guys, mm-hmm. it doesn't, doesn't matter social standing and you're just having like a good conversation, right? Right. You can't buy that. Nope. And, and m- the majority of guys nowadays, or a good percentage of them, are deprived of that. Yes. Yeah. Because they are on Modern Warfare 2 chat rooms rather than being in real life with their friends. Yes. And they're on Twitter or they're on Instagram, whatever, and they're talking to people virtually, but they're not in with the dudes. Yeah. Because there isn't that that unification. Everyone's so busy because of, uh, of the demands of the day-to-day. Yeah. And I think for guys, it just, just get out a little bit more into like Muslim spaces, mm-hmm. and you'll meet like... Fun fact: The way I met, the way I met uh, Abudi over here, I was at the coffee shop. Right. And this guy walks in. I was like, I think I've seen you on Twitter. <laughs> 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 and he goes, I think I've watched your podcast. I was like, Well, there we go. <laughs> I, I, I subscribed to your podcast early on. I think when when Chips was on, I was on. Yeah, a long, long time ago. Yeah, I was like, All oh, these guys look pretty cool. And Subhanallah, right? So yeah, you know, now you just 
And like, it's, all, it's like we already knew each other. Right. So you'd be surprised the amount of connections you can make. And just ask other people around you. And if it's not there, set it up. Right. How hard is it to make a group chat and say, hey, Wednesday nights we're all going to the Yemeni coffee house. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever it is. And you just show up, hang out, just guys only, have a little corner for you guys there, and you'd be surprised how good your week will be, right. how relaxed yeah. you'll be. Yeah. yeah, especially for the guy, especially before marriage, like take advantage, create something that's mm-hmm. a routine. And then when you get married, make sure your wife gets the exact same treatment. So yes. she gets the Thursday nights and you get Wednesday right. nights and you don't compromise. And when kids come, you don't compromise and you're going to stay home with the kids and mm-hmm. she's going to stay home with the kids, even if they're rowdy, even if they're crying, because every day they're doing that. So right. you got to yeah. deal with it. We don't have the village life that our parents had yeah. or the, our great grandparents had where you guys were always with guys mm-hmm. and women were always with women yeah. it, until nighttime or like, you know, you yes. go back to your house, right? No, you don't have that. You're at work or you're, you're running errands, whatever it is. Yeah, and these so are all mixed environments now. And it's and all yes. mixed environments, right? So it, you don't have that naturally. So if you don't have it naturally, you got to find a way to get it. I know at some of the mosques here, they have like, uh, they have the men's halakha. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to say the sheikh's name, but we were <laughs> for some reason we had to have it at the masjid one night. And then these ladies walked up. They're like, oh, sheikh, are you giving a halakha? And he's like, yeah, but it's for men only. And they were like, uh, like sorry, <laughs> you guys have to leave. <laughs> there needs to be spaces for there men only. There needs to be spaces for Especially guys. for younger guys, because when you introduce a female into the mix, the whole hierarchy changes. So yeah. like when guys are in a, in, a, in a group, they naturally make a hierarchy. They know like this is guy is our leader. He's our he's our top, or a group of guys are the top guys. Yeah. And like if you have younger guys, they're learning from the upper guys. Yeah. But you introduce a female into that mix, and it becomes very chaotic. The dynamic is way different. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Especially kids, kids in high school, college. Like if you can just have your boys group. Yeah. And not have to interact with other girls and around school and what on campus, you will have a more that your brotherhood would be stronger. Let's put it yes. that way. Brotherhood would be stronger. Yeah. I, one of like one of the most important. Um, positions in any MSA has got to be like the brother's coordinator from yeah. a guy's perspective. Important. Very important. Like that guy needs to be on top of it. Right. It's a big putting events, Yeah. Most social guy putting events together, pull, pulling all the guys together. That's that, that is the most crucial and uh, if you, time. You look at it at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, he, he would get up after Salat al and he'd turn around and he asked them, who saw a dream? Who, who did this? And they would discuss, they'd have this natural discussion set up into their life. We are social creatures. And testosterone is a social hormone. So these things need to exist. We need to have these these connections. Luckily for us, like when I, when I tell my, my non-Muslim friends, is by the time it's 6.30 a.m., I've already shaken 30 people's hands at, after the Fajr Salah. Mm-hmm. Like you can't beat that level of social in- engagement and social interaction. Well, some of the some of the people I know, they're like, I'm lonely. I'm like, what do you mean you're lonely? Like even the pandemic, we were still praying for But nonetheless, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> there, there, there's, <laughs> there's levels to this. No, no, there really is. Um, and this just goes back to living with the sun, living an Islamic lifestyle. Right. A lot of these hormonal imbalances that you're experiencing can be naturally, your body will naturally revert back to what it knows best if you just follow this lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's it's set up for us. Like as Muslims, we don't need to read the data or listen to a human podcast. It's our lifestyle that already exists. We're not taking that lifestyle. And we're living a lifestyle because we're trying to fuse the two and the, they don't mix. It's oil and water. Where you're staying up late and waking up for Fajr and then sleeping after Fajr, and it's because of a mess that destroys your life. Yeah, imagine if every time someone told you something, they're like, "Oh, I need to see the research on that. I need to see the research on that." What did the scientists say? Like, no, bro, the Prophet did it. Just do it. Khalas, yeah. that, that that's your that's your epistemology. You're done. Just I'm, follow it. You're gonna be good. I could write a whole book about all the things where I'll take a hadith, I'll take a research study, and be like, oh, they match up. And maybe some people need it, but yeah, but they just think <clears throat> even if it's not out, the data the data may come out later. Yeah. So, so fun, if, at a level, we have to understand that we have a lifestyle that works. Yes. Like, what is the, the fruit of that lifestyle? Well, the fruit of that lifestyle is that the the early Islamicate under Abu Bakr al Khattab was the most robust society that existed. Yes. They couldn't be defeated. We already have the blueprint. So you can do all the research you want, but we know what the output of that was. And when the Muslim societies let go of their Islamicness and became more loose and easy with their rules, they became weaker societies. Yes. Yeah, the blueprint is already there. It's in our history. This stuff they couldn't they couldn't succeed in the way that they did mm-hmm. if they were doing something wrong. Right. Yeah, it's right. Inter- I was listening to a, someone pointing me to a podcast. Jeff Bezos uh, being interviewed by uh, Lex Friedman, the other, mm-hmm. and uh, he, he's talking about how Amazon how they run things. He said we always choose anecdotes over metrics. Mm. So for in our example here, the anecdote is the early Sahaba, how mm-hmm. things operated, and then the metrics are like, oh, I don't. Where's the study? I need the paper. I need this. I need that data to back it up. And then it. sometimes he said we'd get data. 
that would not match up with anecdotes. Like the thing for them was like wait times on the phone. It was supposed to be under a minute. And the, the, the dad was like, oh, it should all be good. Why are people complaining? He's like, well, let me just call them. And they called and they were on waiting for like 10 minutes. He's like, okay, so anecdotally, this is what I we care for. The metrics can just be wrong. You're measuring the wrong thing or whatever else. Yeah. So in the same case for this, like, oh, so now I need to see the paper or, oh, mashallah, this is what proves the profits. So I was like, no. But no, it doesn't. Like, you could have just measured the wrong thing or the wrong company funded the study and... And, and yeah. what, what are you going to do when the data says that something yeah. we do is wrong? For example, before fasting became popular, yeah. people were like, oh, fasting is bad for you. Yeah. Growing up, it's always like, that's so bad for you. Yeah. How can you go without water? And, and now everyone's like, oh, fasting's great. And now dry fasting is actually making its rounds. Mm. And people are talking about... Finally getting to that too now. Yeah, huh? people are getting to dry fasting. Wow. Like I have to update the chapter of my book where I'm talking about um, the benefits of fasting because before I was like, the data doesn't really suggest that an Islamic fast would be any better from than the health a, perspective than a, than a, than water, a water fast. fast. Yeah. Um, that's just what the data was, but um, I know there's some kind of benefit to this long fast because it's what is prescribed, right? Yes, but now people are saying, like, Hey, you actually may be at a better state, of course, if you do it safely, to do a drier fast because you are going into your fat cells and getting rid of de deuterium. Like, this water, if it's from a uh, spring water, it will have less deuterium content, but we don't want to overwhelm the, the audience, yeah. And and I, I bet you the studies are just going to end up with you know, you should really just tie it with your circadian clock. So, like, do it when the sun comes out yeah. and then wrap it up when the sun sets, and it's you know, you'll feel amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it's just funny how <laughs> like we were, we were already living that, and that, that's why, yeah, if you look at the Western world, the Western world wasn't able to excel until coffee was introduced because they were living a very defunct life, it was alcohol. Late at night, they were sleeping. They were very unmotivated. While the Islamic societies naturally were able to produce great minds, great scientists, because the overall milieu led to high testosterone state. The testosterone makes the mind into a very structured, rigid, dopaminergic mind and allows people that have the requisite IQs, like you have your different scholars, your yeah. Razi or whoever it may be, that come through and push forward yeah. the, th the impetus. We now, in a, in, as a Muslim society, have a very low milieu that is not conducive to that kind of things. So there may be geniuses that live amongst us, but they're not being used as they should be. Yeah, because they, they're not being amplified. Yes, there you go. Yeah. There we go. So yeah, I'm, ge I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm learning with you guys as we listen uh, Abudi over here. So those were actually the nine points you had in the, um, the covenant. Um, so hopefully, maybe you can, I don't know, if, if you have more to say, uh, I'll leave it open-ended. But if you could go back to a couple of things that you've mentioned um, and also to help for the audience as well. Uh, one was you mentioned birth control, and but I don't think we ever got back to that. So I'm yeah. just curious like what um, how that was affecting things. And then another one, maybe if you could uh, a little more deep into weight loss. Sure. I think yeah. those are two points that were brought up, but we didn't really get time to go through. Yeah. Let's, do, let's do weight loss first. Sure. Uh, that's, that's a, I think that's a big one for guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Everyone, like, especially... I mean, you have the people that are obese. You yes. can tell they're obese, but a lot of what I'm seeing now, um, as I'm also struggling on a weight loss journey, it's a lot of skinny fat. Skinny fat. You know, I feel that's even worse. Like you're skinny, bro. Put on muscle. Why you just why you just look skinny fat? It just looks so bad. <laughs> if you're a big guy, you could be. I'm husky. You know, yes. I'm a power lifter or yes. something. But if you're just skinny fat, ugh, it's paperweight. Yeah, it's uh, what I say is that the inputs of modern society are integrated into your brain and they tell your brain to overeat food and to burn less calories. So the laws of thermodynamics hold up, right? You cannot get around that. If you consume more calories than your body burns, you will store some of that calorie either in muscle or fat, yeah. mostly in fat, and you will get bigger. The question is, why is the body in a state that it is over consuming calories? Now, we can blame the food supply. The food supply is very bad. We can say that people aren't moving as much. We could say that people aren't sleeping as well. These are all factors that go into it. But there is a breakdown centrally of the integration of the signals. And this leads to a person that they're always hungry. And what I say is that you become obese in the mind first, and then you become come overweight. Hmm. There's a breakdown of the calibration. And the evidence for that is there are people that live in our society that no matter how much they eat or what they do, they never gain the fat. They stay skinny always. Yeah. They're always lean. Their bodies are almost immune to the effects of obesity. They yeah. never have to diet. They don't have to worry about it. Because whatever is going on there, whatever genetics they have, whatever physiology they inherited is calibrated to never be that way. And that's how we should be. We talk about this hormone called leptin. So the most important pathway when it comes to 
weight regulation is called a leptin melanocortin pathway. And subhanAllah, when you study this, you really see the, the wisdom in Allah's plan that your skin tone, your skin, your fat level, your sexuality, and your feelings of alertness are all linked in one pathway. They all work together. So the hormone leptin, if you go to most of your doctors and ask them, hey, what is leptin? How does it work for fat loss? They won't be able to answer you. It's not taught well in medical school. Maybe an hour lecture on this. And this is the synchronon. This is the fundamental, essential part of fat regulation. So like we talked about, leptin goes from the fat cells, goes into the brain, tells the brain to, we have nutrients. When leptin is working well, it tells your brain to make testosterone or for females to make estrogen to be fertile. A lot of people's infertility problems is a leptin problem. So a lot of uh, ladies, they can't get pregnant or a lot of guys have very abysmal sperm counts because their leptin regulation is off. Now, leptin binds onto a place called POMC, pro-opiomelanocorn. And this is a protein that breaks down into a couple of different pathways. Number one, ACTH. ACTH is the hormone that makes cortisol in your, in your adrenals. Number two, it makes MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is associated with you getting darker and associated with you um, having um, sexual desire. So that's why animals go into heat in the summer because as they get more sun exposure, they, they, they go into heat, back to light again. And number three, it makes beta endorphin. Beta endorphin is what makes you feel good. So leptin binds on, you get three of these three things being made and your system works well. Palm C neurons, once you stimulate them, it turns down your appetite and raises your resting metabolic expenditure. For example, another thing that's made by Palm C is called CART, cocaine and amphetamine related transcript. So we, we literally, if you are healthy from a leptin perspective, make your own cocaine and amphetamine every day. The, re, the way they, dis- they uh, discovered this was they infuse mice with cocaine and they noticed the levels of this coming up. So what it does, it buffers away some of the cocaine that's being infused. But it has a similar effect where it gives you this clarity of mind, this focus, this energy, and then decreases appetite. So you're talking about someone, this is an issue of leptin sensitivity. Yep. Your leptin pathway is not working well. Was not working well. Is this, what is this tied? Is this tied to light as it's, well? It's light, circadian rhythm, number one. It's the hyper-inflammatory processed diet. It's the poor sleep. It's the high stress. It's all these things mess up the signal of leptin centrally. So they did an experiment on, on mice. When they first discovered leptin, they're like, hey, we figured it out. We're just going to inject them with leptin and they will lose weight, right? No, it didn't work because then you get resistant. Because our biolog- biological systems are way more complicated than we give them credit for. Yeah, it's not just inject one thing yes. and then it's going to fix everything. It's always like it's a biochemical balance. Yes. And, and your it- body's constantly... Doing it's, things, it's yeah. buffering things away. Like yeah. I, I told you, they discovered cart because they <laughs> infused cocaine into the ca- in the mice, and your body makes cart to, to protect you from the effects of cocaine. So it's subhanAllah, your body is very intelligently designed. Now, when leptin breaks down, you get a a boosting of the AGRP pathway, which is a lot of uh, different you know words here. But the point is, this pathway decreases resting metabolic rate and increases appetite. Your resting metabolic rate is what your body's just naturally burning without you doing anything. Yes. So you want to be at a high resting metabolic rate. So you're burning more calories just at a resting state. So even if you're eating or not eating too much, you're losing calories day on day. Right. Yes. So, so if we put two people on the same amount of calories, they will lose weight. Whether they eat them at night, they eat them in the day, it doesn't matter. But the reality of the world is we aren't in the lab. We aren't having calorie intake based on that. We are choosing or making decisions every day. And if your leptin sensitivity is, is off, you will walk by that cinnamon roll and be like, hey, that looks really good. I want to eat it. But when your leptin sensitivity is very functional, you're like, nah, I don't want to eat that. It, it changes the way you perceive appetite and perceive food. Right? So this is the, the crucial thing there is that we are broken at a fundamental brain level and then you have obesity. So practically, how do you undo that is the question. Is Number one, you fix your circadian rhythm. We've been talking about that like a broken clock all day. Number two, you need to fix the um, food pattern to match the circadian clock. Mm. So we should be eating our calories earlier in the day. So, and there's research about this called time-restricted eating, where you push your calories earlier in the day and go to bed two to three hours, no food, with a little bit of hunger. So it's some form of uh, intermittent fasting. Yeah, you want to move the calories earlier. Though A lot of people do intermittent fasting where they eat at noon, which it works if you're lean already, but if you're already broken from leptin perspective, that only exacerbates the problem. Okay. So you want to eat high protein earlier in the day, 
you want to move your calories earlier. And when you, you say high protein, what do you what do you say? Eggs, milk, no, 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 cheese. like gram wise. Gram wise, 30, 40 gram. Okay. It, which is which is enough to boost an anabolic um, stimulus f- for your workout if you are the type yeah. that does workout. Um, and you want to be satiated, and then you don't want to you don't want to snack throughout the day. Now, as someone's going to say, but I snacked and I lost weight. Yes, if you eat a certain amount of calories, you will lose weight. But what we're talking about is a top-down perspective and a bottom-up perspective. You can top-down for somebody, put them in a room, and only give them 1,800 calories a day. They will lose weight, no matter when they eat them. It doesn't matter because they only have a set amount of calories. But the real world is not this locked-up uh, laboratory, and you make decisions each day. So you want to allow yourself to get in a state where your body is less likely to crave those high-calorie processed foods. For example... If you take somebody, put them on a night shift or sleep deprive them and then measure levels of different hormones, their leptin levels crash down and their ghrelin levels go sky high. Ghrelin is a hormone made by the gut and it tells your brain that you're hungry. So literally these cues come into your brain and all these signals, cortisol, ghrelin, leptin, testosterone, estrogen, insulin, all these things are integrated in your brain and that sets out a, a, a either eat or don't eat signal. So the problem is we have to rearrange the signals. And what I do when someone tells me that they're um, trying to lose weight is first I, I analyze what are these signals. I'm like, hey, what, what's going on with your stress? What's going on with your circadian clock? What's going on with your movement patterns? For example, there is a, a compound made when you exercise called lac that they're just discovering recently that it's made by the muscle. It goes up to the brain and tells you to eat less. I look at their um, actual dietary intake. Are they eating a hyper-processed, high-refined diet that's not satiating to the brain? Um, and I look at um, the psychology of going on. Are they, are they eating because they're trying to numb some kind of pain that they're going through? You can look at their whole systems, look at what signals are going up to the brain and breaking that signal, and then you undo the signals one by one. Then, once the signals are proper, you put them on a diet, and then they start naturally losing weight because mm. now they're able, able to adhere to the diet without the consequences because anybody can diet. The problem is once you start dieting, your body def- goes into defense mode, like, whoa, 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 I don't want to lose this weight. I'm going to try to keep as much as possible. I'm going to make you hungry. I'm going to make you bingey. I'm going to make you uh, less metabolically active. Your brain function decreases. Your testosterone tanks. So you have to be able to undo a lot of this damage. And that's why a lot of people, when they fix their skinning clock, they notice they're losing weight without dieting because they're now more in tune with the fat level they already have. So the biggest thing with the leptin resistance is the fix, your, fix your clock. Yes. Don't be a time traveler. Yeah, don't be lost in time. Don't be lost in time. And eat protein early in the day. Eat protein early in the day. Move more. And less processed yeah. foods. Because remember, fundamentally, I keep saying that word, but fundamentally, the problem that causes obesity is technology. You can graft the rise of technology and obesity, and they pretty much are parallel. Mm-hmm. Because it's light, it's processed foods. We are too good for our own good. We're good at making the best processed foods. We have the best food scientists in the world at Lay's, at these different companies, making you the perfect chip that when you crunch it, it melts in your mouth and you hear the noise and it's aesthetically pleasing. The right amount of butter, the right amount of fat, the right amount of salt. Everything is well programmed for you to be hooked on to these foods. Yeah. So you buy it again and again and again. Right. Because at the end of the day, all the food companies are competing yes. for that bite. Yes. So it's going to be as addictive as possible. Yeah, they, they have a big amount of their budget going to food scientists to figure yeah. this out for you. If they could put crack in it, they would. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Coca-Cola <laughs> used to have cocaine in it. Yeah, yeah. When you put it like that, maybe you shouldn't be eating this stuff, right? Yeah, so, so the <coughs> processed foods are not commensurate with our biology. They are they are toxic. Some people will live, they're, they're lean, they eat junk food all day, and they stay like that, that way because they have different genetic factors that protect them. Yeah, like Warren Buffett's diet would, like, destroy the average 20-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he eats McDonald's all day. He like, eats McDonald's and just drinks Diet Coke <laughs> every day. And yeah. he's fine. <laughs> I, I will say I feel, I don't have evidence for this. It's not scientific. I do feel that that generation was just built differently because they grew up with a better upbringing. They, had, they were eating better foods. They were unprocessed. They were getting sunlight. They were out there. I feel like they're immune from a lot of the problems, and which is why I see someone like my father whose testosterone is working fine. His health is good. He takes care of himself. But, and I see some other people that are younger and they're just completely breaking down. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. But my dad's always outside. He work, His job requires him to be outdoors. He's not under LED light for any part of the day, necessarily. Which he doesn't. He didn't set up his life that way. It just happened to be that was his job. Yeah, that was his job. Yeah. yeah. Um, a 
you, if you don't mind, the, the last topic then, and the birth control sure. thing you brought up, what was that about? So the birth control, when, you, when a woman takes birth control, they shut down the axis from their brain to their ovaries. They're, they shut down that whole pathway. And what people have noticed is that... We're talking about the pill specifically? Yeah, okay. or a, any kind of estrogen coming it's into all, the Yeah, it's all the same, right? Yeah, we're not, no, talking, no, we're, no. Not, we're not talking about the condoms. Physical. We're not talking about IUD. We're talking about yeah, so hormonal birth control. Down, yes. That's why. <coughs> Let's clarify that. Hormonal, hormonal birth control yeah. will shut down the access that sh- runs between the brain and the ovaries. Now, what people have noticed is that different times of the month, females will desire a different type of man. For example, they, sh- they show them a picture of a man, and they'll show the same guy, but more feminine and more masculine. We'll make the jaw a little bit bigger. They'll make the beard a little bit stronger, more rigid masculine structures. While she is ovulating, she is more likely to like a man that is more aggressive, more masculine. Because it's signaling he's healthy, he has high testosterone levels. This is a man I want his genetics to be part of my offspring. During the rest of the month, when she's on her menstruation cycle, whatever it may be, she's more likely to pick a more softer guy because she wants a more nurturing, caring mate. When you are on birth control, hormonal birth control, you shut down this whole axis. She is not ovulating anymore. She's less likely to like the very hyper-aggressive masculine man. So what's anecdotally being reported now is women have been on birth control. They marry their boyfriend. Who's a soft guy or something. Yes, yeah. or like a guy that, that, and then she gets off birth control and no longer likes that man because it changes fundamentally the preference that she has for men. That's very interesting. Yeah, very dangerous too. Because, so then these things, they, they change our perception of reality. Remember, it's all about raising the dial, lowering the dial, testosterone, estrogen, whatever these things are, they change the way we color our worlds. So when this is breaking down, you're getting very bad consequences to society. And that's why most of the high T societies in history have been hyper fertile. Yeah. Like the fertility rate in Gaza is, is 10x fertility rate anywhere else. Because it's a very like competitive, tough society now because they're, they're under they're unoccupied before the war. They're under occupation, they're under um, siege, and they, they feel like this 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 umph to their life that we don't have here. It's very yeah. comfortable here. Yeah. No, you're right. There's that story about the <laughs> someone smuggled his sperm yes. out of prison and then yeah. his wife got pregnant. <laughs> For, for, fertility, see, fertility like, wow. is very high T energy, man. That, that yeah. is the most high T reproductive energy that exists because it, you realize that testosterone helps you to compete against other men, so you may get the woman and then get her pregnant. Yeah. So that that is the whole role of testosterone to make you fertile to spread your seed. It's crazy, and then this also then encouraged us to um, multiply and be fertile. So your recommendation is for women to not go on birth control. Hormonal birth control. I mean, that's the discussion between her, her and her physician to, to have that, that discussion and, and different lifestyles. Well, this is the podcast. And blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But I mean, at this point, if, if, if the ladies are even listening to this podcast after they, they hated everything else we said, but I, I personally would not. If, yeah. I, if I was a, a female and I knew all this information, I would not jump on the birth control pill. Because yeah. you're, you're changing the way your, your neurocircuitry is working. Like, this shouldn't be. Like, the problem with our medical system now is we, we think we understand how the system works. It's like, oh, it's simple. Just do this. And, and you shut down the whole system. It's, it's fine, right? But we're playing with things that are that are so complex and so complicated and all these different regulatory mechanisms. We shouldn't be playing willy-nilly with, with these systems. Yeah. Even though it has been studied for years, I don't think any of the studies would have told you that introduce, introducing a birth control would have had the effect it had, has had on our society today. Yeah, when they say studied, they didn't learn every single thing about it. They studied, yeah. okay, this, we had this many cases of heart attacks, this many cases of this, many cases of that. They didn't study the psychological metrics of do you like this man or don't you like this man. When people say studies, it's, it's a very wishy-washy thing. Yeah. Like I, I've run research studies. I've done research studies. We don't look at every single variable. We're looking at what target variable we care about yeah. for that study. So a lot of this is like, oh, studies say, what studies? And how did you interpret the studies? And what was the bias of the author? And there is something psychologically weird about like <clears throat> dissociating intercourse from procreation. Yes. So that, that's another thing. I don't know. I don't think people have talked about that too much or I haven't read anything or listened to anything about it. But I just, I just do think, I, in my own, personally, I just think that's weird. Um, like you shouldn't have that. Like in college, actually, I, I knew multiple, I mean, they're not Muslims. I don't know, like the Muslim side, but... It's very common like, as, as a doctor. They would be prescribed birth control to treat other things. Yes. Like they weren't—they're not sexually active. Yeah, exactly. Acne and like someone had like an ulcer or something. Like they could, just to regulate things, they would take it naturally, just all the time. Interesting. They yeah, have you, a boyfriend. You, they don't get nothing. You nailed it. <coughs> That's the problem. We have these tools in our disposal as a medical community, 
And like, oh, you have acne because because of X Y Z factors that we don't want to dig into: a diet, sleep, hormonal health, not going to the sun, blah, all these things. And you have an inflammatory state. Like your skin's telling you, "Hey, I'm inflamed. I'm putting pus out into my skin." You know what? Just take hormones, and, and shut down the whole system, and then you won't have to worry about acne. That is such a shotgun approach to dealing with a specific problem. Like, hey, so you can look better, which is an important thing psychologically to look normal. Let's just shut down your whole endocrine system from the brain to the ovaries, so you don't have to worry about. This. What a what a joke of society. Some girl's been on like birth control since she's like twelve. There's some people they've been on for a while. Years, and, and, yeah. And remember, the hormones that come out during puberty shape the way your brain develops. So like we're willy nilly throwing this out. Like okay, who cares? It's safe. How do you know? Like we'll, we'll, like we'll, sometimes I'm flabbergasted when I when I see things in the medical community. I'm somebody who loves the medical system for what it can offer us, but we need to be careful in what we do with it because willy nilly we just destroy people's lives and aren't thinking about what is it doing to the society as a whole? What is it doing to this one individual? Because we're just looking at certain metrics. Like, is there side effects or not side effects? Can we make money out of this? And at the end of the day, remember, these are products to be sold and bought. This is a pharmaceutical product. They want you as a long-term customer. So that's why a lot of these things get pushed through. Yeah. A lot of these pharmaceuticals pushing certain things to doctors. You just get bonuses if you prescribe it. I don't know if that's legal. N- and not necessarily that the doctor gets bonuses. <coughs> it's worse than that. The doctor went to medical school, and medical school taught them that this was good. But the medical school curriculum is based on those studies. Those studies are funded by these pharmaceutical companies. So then now you have a bias introduced. And they're like, no, but we declared our bias. Yes, every study has bias. But we have to realize that our system is not set up to make you feel better and, and be stronger. Our system was set up in the age of antibiotics. It's like you had an infection. Here's an antibiotic. Let's cure that. So the, the, the whole fundamental idea of the, the, the ethos of the medical system is, hey, let's just give you a pill to treat a problem. But you can, not most of these problems, diabetes, depression, a heart disease, all these things, they're not one pill for one problem solutions. It's not antibiotics. It's a multimodal disciplinary approach because it's the whole lifestyle being integrated and coming out. You have multiple things dealing with multiple pathways affecting multiple things. Multiple gen- different genetics, different people, yeah. uh, different in- interaction between your gut microbiome, the genetics of the different yeah. bacteria you have. It's such a complex system and the hubris that our physicians and our medical system has that they understand everything so well and so easily. And they shun to think that, hey, the system was already healthy. Because remember, what most doctors will quote you is that before modern medicine, everyone lived to 40. That is not accurate. What happened was there was a high infant mortality rate and high infection mortality rate of early life. So that on average, people would live until 30 if you average them. But there were people that if you passed infancy and passed childhood infections, you would live to 80, 90, 70, whatever it may be. You lived a normal full life. So you're saying on average it was low because of the high infant mortality rate. Yeah, but the range was still normal. Now, we, we've enhanced the range a little bit now because we can force people to get a few years out of their life <laughs> with different heart pumps and heart valves and electrical devices and all these yeah. things. Great. But... People live vitally till 70 and 80 before modern medicine was, was existing. But the way that they speak about this thing is like, before modern medicine, you guys all died at 40. It's like, no, we did not. Yeah. And, and it's just this hubris. They come in with this whole discussion. They don't want to look actually at history because they don't read anything but medical books. So they're so cut off from reality. And they lack that nuance and flavor. That's why if you ask a doctor why testosterone exists, they'd be like, oh, for, for reproduction and for, for muscles. Like, no, testosterone is a social hormone to help you defeat other men. But they don't understand the history of that. They don't understand the rise and fall of, of different civilizations because we have a very monofocal um, lifestyle. If you look at the great scientists and the great researchers in the Islamicate, they were multidisciplinary uh, wizards. They would know my science and Islamic studies and different avenues of understanding so they can color their world better and they can reach the modern man. It's impossible to do that nowadays. You like, shouldn't be an expert in everything. I agree. Back then, you, you could like conquer philosophy in like three years. <laughs> it's only so many books. You have yeah, to get yeah, through, yeah. Right? <laughs> now it, it's impossible, right? But you you should have like you should be more well rounded. Whereas Western society in general tends to reward the hyper specialized individual. Yes. Right, and it pushes everyone to hyper specialization, which is good. But uh, everyone ends up operating in silos, yes. right? And and you you never really have that that big picture. I mean, even for our Islamic scholarship, we need to have Islamic scholars that have other specialities and other fields in their in their toolkit. For example, Dr. Hatim al Hajj, he's a physician and he's an Islamic scholar. Yeah. So he's able when they have a fatwa about some kind of medical th- issue, they reach out to his opinion. Yeah. So we need to color our whole world and our whole reality with multiple a- avenues yeah. of understanding. And so instead of us scrolling mindlessly on TikTok with blue light, 
night and destroying your whole sleep and I'm, 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 I'm micro learning. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> micro learning nothing. It's just, it's, just, it's just like dulling of the brain, man. It's like it's like just like processed food is bad for you. Process processed information is also bad for you. Hundred percent. And then that's what we're getting from our society, and we're not um, building up a good base, a foundation with books, with uh, good food, getting outside, all these things. I think we're reaching our natural end to all the topics. Was Perfect. there something else you wanted to add? I think we, na- we nailed it. We nailed it. Well, key takeaways, average guy. Let's just wrap it up on this one. You know, 25-year-old comes to you, hey, I'm feeling tired. I want to get married. You know, I'm not, I don't feel good in life. Give, give, him, give him a prescription for something. You want to optimize this individual, right? And you get to spend a week with him. What, what are you going to do? Yeah, we're, we're going to wake up every day. At okay. We're going to go to the measure. Great. After measure, we're going to go on a, on a long walk and let our minds unwind. Our phone is still on airplane mode. You're oh, so allowed. I don't have my AirPods in? No. Okay. No AirPods in. You're, you allow your mind to un, unload everything. We either go for a walk or go for a workout. You're going to come back. You're going to set up your day. You're going to plan your day. You're going to get that sunlight exposure like we talked about. You're going to eat a high-protein, unprocessed foods, foods that are nutritious for you. You're going to try to nourish your body rather than just feed yourself. From Masculinity is about nourishment. Femininity is about consumption. Key, key delineation there. You're going to work aggressively towards a goal and see what's going on with other men around you and try to compete against that. You're going to get some kind of workout in, whether it was in the morning like we talked about or in the afternoon. You're going to have yourself a lot, so your day is very structured. You're going to go to sleep after a shot to the chagrin of your friends on Modern Warfare and Call of Duty. You're going to go to sleep early, and you're going to repeat that day in, day out. And what about mindset? What am I thinking? How am I, how am I visualizing life? You're visualizing, you're visualizing life that you're going to conquer and win, and you're going to defeat everyone against you. And you should have people you set up in your in your frame of mind that are your enemies, whether that's just your you yesterday or Shaylon or whatever it is. There should be some kind of enemy that you're fighting against. That's what, like we talked about. Michael Jordan was set up uh, some kind of fake enemy just to be able to conquer that enemy. So you shut up. You set up your day to win, to thrive, to want to to do that. At first, you're not going to have the neural hormonal cascade necessary for that because you are low testosterone, low dopamine state. But once you live this life and you naturally have sunlight and good sleep and good food and good mindset and you're hanging around with good guys so you find a group of friends and you're going to go to the gym together and you're going to get stronger at different lifts and you're not going to have your AirPods in while, while you're doing that and you're not going to scroll. Oh, and the other thing, most importantly, if you're 25 years old and you want to get married, you're going to stop the pornography. Now, yeah, we didn't even talk about that. Oh, boy. Yeah, that, that, that needs its own thing. I mean, this is the biggest yeah. calamity of calamities when it comes to masculinity. Because I think it affects Muslim men more than non-Muslim men. Because the non-Muslim men can just, will just go get the real thing. Yeah, because they're, they're in parallel getting the real thing and watching pornography. Yeah. But a Muslim man from 15 until 25, he's 30 years old, he's only accustomed to pornography. He marries an innocent little hijabi girl. And he, and he expects her to behave anything like the girl in the por- porno. Good luck with that marriage. Those guys are in my DMs every single day. Hey, brother, I got married. I can't stay hard for my wife. What do I do? How many like anecdotal stories have we heard where like the guy, the girl gets divorced? Remember? And it's like, oh, they, they never consummated the marriage. They're married for like six months. Literally, the guy can't get hard enough to, to penetrate, let alone break a, virgi- a girl's virginity. So it's a giant problem yeah. on that because they're accustomed to a gorilla grip and they're accustomed to a crazy, colorful porn scene that they're, they're getting off of yeah. for 10, 15 years. They're not calibrated to have sex with a woman themselves. They're, they're into voyeurism of watching somebody not have sex. Having. Yeah. Having sex. Remember, the masculine is doing, the, the feminine is consumptive. So it's a very, it's a very feminine, low T thing. Yeah. It's a very low T thing. And then they get into it and then they, like, they get married and their wife is like probably some shy girl, if that. And good luck on, on consummating the marriage. And plus, now in order for him to get off, they have something called porn induced erectile dysfunction. Yeah. He can't even get off without thinking about pornography yeah. in his brain if he's getting able to even get hard enough for sexual intercourse. Yeah. So talk about the disaster of disasters when it comes to uh, foundational societies. And then he feels shame and guilt, so that drives hit and high stress, and that drives his testosterone even lower, so he's even less sexually functioning, and he doesn't want to approach her. She's sh- afraid to go talk to her family and tell the society because it's embarrassing for them. Yeah, so, she thinks something wrong with her, like, oh, I'm yeah. not pretty enough, I'm ugly, you know. Right, He's not. why is he not getting attracted to me? Yeah, yeah. 
and and it, and it's just a, a perpetual cycle. And then so then young guys tell me like, well, what do I do? Like I'm I'm 19. I'm not gonna get married for another five years. What do I do? First off, get married. <laughs> no, hundred percent. Yeah, we get we, married we early. To society to get married. Get married in, early. In in, re, in reality, that doesn't happen for all these guys. You really like, just got to start fasting. Yeah, I mean, they got to start fasting. But I there's this idea of sexual transmutation. Like the, you'll find it in books like Think and Grow Rich and stuff. This isn't medical. This isn't this isn't some kind of scientific thing. What I say is every man has intercourse daily. What? Every man daily has intercourse. He either has intercourse with a woman. Okay. Or he has intercourse with reality. You impose your will on reality, on existence. You use that sexual tension, that sexual energy to go out and work hard and achieve your goals. So a lot of guys like Muhammad Ali, two months before his fights, he'd have no sex. Because he'd channel all that pent-up energy into the fight, into a goal, into something. I didn't know that. Yeah, no sex before, before a fight. Two months? Yeah. Wow. And this is a guy, by the way. We shouldn't talk about people's sins, but it was known. He was the... Uh, Quite the, the ladies, man. So you, you have to channel the energy somewhere else into something. And if you're not using pornography, you naturally will have uh, wet dreams and you will yeah. uh, excrete whatever you need to excrete. So the, yeah. the thing is, when a guy tells me, well, I haven't had wet dreams, I'm like, it's because you're watching pornography. And you're not getting into REM sleep and deep sleep and all these things. And you feel into a low, low T state. Yeah. Yeah. And and the amount of like thirst trap content. Yeah, out there. It's soft because you know part of the, part part of this like podcast you have to do like social media and you got to yes. research how this stuff works. It's all thirst trap content. Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Like how often I'm on your own Twitter that sometimes I'll just see like just some rando bimbo yeah. posting her OnlyFans. Like anything that goes viral, they just like post like, oh here's my link. Like why why is this here? You know, every single one of my posts, I get ten different girls that are just bots. Yeah, posting naked pictures. I'm like I didn't need to see this today. No, so it. And all this stuff, it's like funneling you into OnlyFans, right? You, you see something on Instagram, on TikTok, and all those big accounts, they're all just funneling you back. Right. So, and there's, there's like, there's no age filter no. for this stuff. You can say not interested as much as you want or like block accounts, but it, it comes all, up. It just comes up. It's softcore porn funnel. Also because of the, your friends. Yes. Your like friends it, are watching this stuff. Because your friends yeah. are watching it, so we're so suggest it on oh, your... So the algorithm knows. For, yeah. for example, like, our, these are people yeah. right now... All, all have spoken to each other, yeah. and it knows like, hey, this guy watches this, this guy watches this. They've been hanging out for th- for a few hours, so they, maybe they're interested in the same thing. So it'll show me whatever ads you've been looking at. Yeah. So they'll have predictive programming. Yeah. So if you're hanging around a bunch of wankers. <laughs> it's it's going to show you all the w- w- wanker content. And I'll tell you this to you, to young boys. We got to find the wanker. <laughs> g- girls can know, can tell if you're a wanker. They behave differently around you when you're a wanker or, or when not. I will, I will tell you this. If you do not wank, the way the girls approach you is very different. They 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 can sense it. I don't know. It's not scientific, but there's something there. This guy you had for a week or whatever, they're yeah. recalibrating. How long until anyone who's trying to implement this in their life till like it becomes more natural? We're like, okay, I'm I'm undoing a lot of the yeah. bad effects. Like, how long do I have to, to you know, see it? All the researchers will say different things: thirty days, forty days, ninety days, whatever it is. The cool thing about the circadian clock is because you're using light and it's ready to calibrate to light. Within a few days, I've seen people like two weeks, they do the, they get the bright light every morning and they sleep early at night. They're calibrated for that. Like they, they naturally will feel sleepy at night and they'll naturally just wake up with that alarm clock. And just within one to two weeks, a month at most, and you're calibrated. Because if you have a good circadian base, now you can start layering things on top of that. Yeah. To build up to a pinnacle. That's like the foundation. Yes. That's the foundation for everything. Yeah, it's the foundation yeah. for everything. And it's something that every single human being had until the modern era. Because like the worst you could do at night was like a, a candle or fire, and that's not like I bet you try this: put on the candle and no light at night, and see how sleepy you naturally get. You can barely get to bed. You feel like this rush, and that's what melatonin is supposed to feel like. The reason people pop melatonin pills and do should, not do that. That's we shouldn't so, be doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But training, again, you're training your body to not produce its own melatonin. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and people have debated like it's healthy, it's not healthy, but. Uh, why don't you just naturally make your own melatonin yeah. and have that ready for you so you can fall into deep sleep, get that growth hormone uh, be, uh, peak. That's the reason a lot of 30-year-old guys don't feel well and don't feel recovered because they're not getting growth hormone to regenerate their joints and their muscles and all these things. And then get the natural testosterone production between 2 and 3 a.m. Yeah. And that, that young man, and we're taking for 25, for 25 years old for a few days, by the end of that, they should be waking up every morning, morning wood, very aggressive, ready to go. Um, within 20 minutes of waking, they're naturally going to be uh, all, all engines firing and then now you can healthily be productive without having to take stimulants and all these other things so everyone's like hey should I take on an Adderall prescription bro it's like no you don't need an Adderall prescription you need to be fundamentally 
sound when it comes to a health perspective. And a lot of guys will message me like, hey, how did you keep your health during medical school? Because most people gain 30, 40 pounds during medical school, if, if not more, and they get very sick and they're, they're not feeling, not most people, a lot of people get sick during medical school. I was like, I kept health first and from health, I was able to create productivity and be able to study and to do all these different things and learn all these um, life hacks, protocols, whatever it may be, so that I can continue to keep going and now I get to make content about it. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Fantastic. Well, that's a great note to end it on. Yeah. So um, don't, don't be a wanker. Don't be a wanker and wake up for Fajr. Yes. That's amazing. Coffee. Amazing. That's okay. Good. Well, Jazakallah Khair, yeah, Abudi, for joining us. This is Amr Mabrook with the Prophetic Mentality Podcast signing off. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.